Okay, good morning, everybody. Chair of the County Government of Viken, Tonje Brenna, Vice President of the Norwegian Association of Local and Regional Authorities, Gunmarit Ergesen, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Stefano Marta, and I'm the coordinator of the SD program on the, the territorial approach to the SDGs, and uh, I'm really delighted <laughs> to open this uh, uh, second day of the roundtable. So before I begin, I would like just to flag two uh, very few uh, housekeeping uh, matters. So the first one is that uh, the meeting is being recorded and it will be made available uh, by the end of this week on the OECD website. The second one is that I will really encourage you to ask a question using the Q&A function and not the chat. The chat is basically used only for technical uh, issue for the, for the team. And, uh, uh, and then we are really like, uh, we have uh, uh, almost more than 700 people registered. So we really would like to have this uh, uh, second day of the round table very interactive. We are going to use uh, uh, Mentimeter tools and other web tools to uh, engage you in the discussion. And uh, if you would like to um, have more information about uh, the OECD work on the territorial approach to the SDGs, you can access the synthesis report uh, that you can find uh, on the slide uh, uh, at the left and also access uh, the, uh, the web tool on the indicator framework and the five reports that we have been producing so far in the program. Um, yesterday roundtable focused uh, uh, on uh, the key role of cities and regions to achieve the in the decade of action to achieve the SDGs. We launched three OECD report on the territorial approach to the SDGs in Flanders, Viken, and uh, in Southern Denmark. And we also discussed the importance of coordinating voluntary local reviews with voluntary national review to improve the multi-level governance of the SDGs. Today, the session will focus on uh, uh, the key role of the SDGs to help cities and regions in the recovery phase from COVID-19. And in particular, the first session, we're going first to present uh, the OECD uh, city note on policy responses to COVID and have a panel discussion where many cities and many regions will, will present their good practices on COVID responses. The second session that will be opened by Professor Jeffrey Sachs will focus very much on how the SDGs can provide the right framework to help cities and regions recover from COVID-19. So now, without further ado, I will give the floor to Lamia for the opening remarks. Lamia is the director of the Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities. So Lamia, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefano. Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, good afternoon for uh, people uh, in, uh, in Asia. Um, I'm very pleased to be with you today. Uh, dear Tonya Brena, dear Gunmarit Elgesen, Ladies and gentlemen, um, so I'm really uh, delighted to be a part of the opening of the second day of this uh, third OECD roundtable on cities and regions for the SDGs, which uh, is going to focus today on long term recovery from uh, COVID-19. We are indeed uh, living through one of the world's greatest crises, with many of our countries now battling a second wave. Yesterday I was participating to a, to a conference in Chicago and see some people in the United States were much more talking about a third wave, Why in Europe we are much more talking about a second wave. So uh, whether it's a second or third wave, we are all in a, in a very difficult situation and our immediate priority is of course to protect the vulnerable population, the old, the sick, uh, the employed, and the poor and uh, governments across the world have taken unprecedented steps to control the virus and support businesses, jobs and households. And the OECD has been uh, by their side in shaping uh, policy responses. Our digital hub uh, on the coronavirus continue, continue to provide uh, the latest data analysis and recommendation with now more than 160 policy briefs covering almost all areas of the OECD work. As you know, the OECD is a multidisciplinary organization. So we are covering all uh, sectors, including, of course, 
cities and regions. Um, I want to flag uh, a couple of uh, interesting policy notes that we have put on this uh, uh, on the on this uh, COVID nineteen hub. One is called uh, the cities uh, policy responses, and Aziza is going to uh, to present the detail of it. But there is also an interesting one called territorial dimension of COVID nineteen. Um, both not provide uh, guidance to address the differentiated impact of the crisis across regions and cities, and they are based, among uh, others, on new evidence that we collected through a, a joint survey with the EU uh, Committee of Regions, which involved more than 300 sub-national governments in the EU, but also data collection uh, that we, uh, we, we managed to, uh, to gather from uh, more than 100 cities around the world, including through our network of the 60 uh, mayors in the, uh, that formed the coalition of champion mayors for inclusive growth. So it's a really a, a wealth of information and data that you can find. And I really invite you to have a look at the uh, OECD uh, coronavirus uh, hub. Uh, so government initial policy responses worldwide, they have been really, really significant. And uh, I would say for a, a large number of countries, quite ambitious. Uh, we have seen national and some national government that have announced large economic recovery packages already much larger than in 2008, with significant support for firms and for and for people, especially for vulnerable populations. Um, since March, there is a, a, an interesting data to, to retain. Since March, uh, they have spent more than $12 trillion globally. And all these efforts have worked to sustain, of course, many jobs and many businesses uh, in, around the world. This was the, the, the right thing uh, to do. So, um, but there is some good news recently that we have seen that many of the latest generation of national uh, recovery packages across OECD countries, they have an explicit territorial dimension, which was not the case, for instance, after um, the global financial crisis of 2008, or even in the first generation of uh, national recovery plan, the territorial dimension was not uh, prominent. Now it's really uh, gaining much more prominence, and this is this is a good news. Um, they indicate uh, some specific plan to provide specific support to the most affected cities and regions, and to support, for instance, uh, a group of firms, and particularly SMEs, at the local level. Uh, Two-thirds of OECD countries are providing direct assistance through, uh, sub to subnational finance. So, uh, so there is now a, a greater um, acknowledgement and interest about the place-based dimension for the policy uh, responses. So, but now, now, of course, we need to start looking forward toward the long-term recovery, especially that we are hearing more and more good news about possible uh, vaccine being uh, available soon, but we have to plan anyway. I mean, we will, we will have a recovery when, we don't know, but we will have a recovery. Um, and of course, the focus cannot be on returning to how we were. Uh, this crisis has uh, highlighted the unsustainable nature of many environmental and social trends, especially in cities, you know, because we have a lot of uh, information at the national level. But when you go local and you know, you, you see what is going on within cities, you know, you can have a more granular picture about the impact of, of COVID. And it's making us question the way we work, the way we travel, the way we consume. Um, definitely, we need to um, use this crisis as an opportunity to reboot and build back better toward uh, a, a brighter future, which is uh, ours to shape. So now, as we look for ways to rebuild our economy and to repair some of the damage caused by the crisis, the short-term measures or quick fixes won't be enough. We need really to start thinking about the long-term solutions to make our economies more resilient and able to withstand future shocks, because certainly there will be future shocks, and to make our societies more inclusive and our practices more sustainable. So in this context, how to make this happen? Because everybody's saying the same things, you know, but how to do it? Um, I would say that uh, the SDG could be, and I would even say that they should be our guide. 
Uh, they should be the guide to help uh, our regions and cities recover from the health, economic, social, and environmental impact of the pandemic. Of the pandemic. So why do I believe that the SDGs are so fundamental for the recovery? Uh, I would list three key uh, reasons. The first is that the SDG provide a framework to identify local base based priorities which are directed towards sustainable development, which is now essential. And this is, for instance, the case in Bonn, where the municipal council adopted the, 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 the city's first sustainability strategy, using the, um, the SDGs as a, a basis to foster low carbon means of transport, clean and uh, affordable energy, fair trade and global responsibility. This is uh, the case also in Moscow, where the SDGs are used as a, as a checklist to ensure local development programs are in line with uh, sustainable development outcomes. So through the work that we have been doing with all these cities, and we have concretely uh, nine uh, case studies plus three coming, uh, uh, you know, going local and looking at a very specific example, we were able to identify, you know, some of the best practice that really goes into the, the direction that I mentioned, and that can be, you know, uh, uh, disseminate and, 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 and replicate more broadly for the, uh, for the recovery. Uh, the second reason why I think the SDGs are a fundamental tool for recovery is that they can help foster coordination across national, regional, and local levels of government. And this is, of course, essential to align priorities, incentives, objectives, and, and make the best of the resources. And we know that we are going to face um, a lot of problem with resources. They are going to be more scarce uh, with the crisis. So this is really essential. The problem of, uh, of getting uh, alignment is really um, more than ever important. And we have seen countries like Germany and, and Japan, the central government there, they have been promoting uh, the localization of the SDGs by supporting cities and regions to use these SDGs in their own local strategies. And these governments are helping them both financially and through uh, capacity uh, building programs. And finally, the third reason why SDGs are really important tools they are not just a concrete framework. Um, they are very important tools that can be used uh, to, uh, to generate the, the recovery, to, uh, to foster the recovery, is that um, they really compel governments to engage with the whole of society, including the private sector, as well as civil society and citizens. And uh, one of the examples uh, of case study that we, we have conducted is in the state of uh, Parana in Brazil. Um, Parana actually is, uh, is using the 2030 agenda to engage and communicate with the civil society, the youth and the creative industries. Um, so there's an, also another one in uh, Koparubur in Iceland, which is using the SDGs to build awareness and strengthen ownership of its own local strategy among private sector and civil society, including via a, a survey and, uh, and online portals for public consultation. So these are, again, two other very interesting examples on how uh, these uh, cities and regions are using the SDGs to better engage with the civil society, the private sector, which actually is going to become a little bit more the new normal in, the, in terms of local and regional governance in the future. So today, it's, the conversation is going to be about looking forward to a brighter future. And uh, as uh, the famous ar uh, American architect and urban designer, Daniel Borham said, make no little plan. And I'm quoting him because uh, yesterday I was discussing with, uh, with colleagues in Chicago, and I know that he was really behind the first plan of, of Chicago. So we need, uh, we need to think big. We need to be bold. And we need to work together to secure a brighter future. The SDGs definitely offer cities and regions and national government a ways toward this uh, big, bold, and brighter future and challenge us uh, to seize uh, the, that future for ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, uh, and all the next generation. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the OCD stands really ready to work uh, with. Uh, with you to make sure this is happening 
And uh, that is all this is translating into better policy for better lives, which is the motto of the OECD. And of course, I wish you all a fruitful uh, discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lamia, for these uh, opening remarks. Uh, we will now hear from uh, Tonya Brenna, the uh, chair of the county government of Viken. Tonya, you have the floor. Thank you, Stefano, and thank you, uh, Lamia, for a very powerful uh, opening of the day. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, the Danish Prime Minister, Mette Fredriksen, uh, she uh, says when she speaks about rebuilding uh, the country after COVID-19 that not only are we going to rebuild Denmark, we're going to reinvent Denmark. And I think that's uh, a good word to take with us into also this day of uh, the roundtable session. Uh, we are discussing with each other, we are learning from each other, and we are doing it despite the fact that we cannot meet during these times. There are advantages, obviously, to these new digital formats as well. And I'm sure many of the great speakers who are here today and many of the listeners uh, who are with us would not be able to be here if we had to travel across the world to meet each other. So there are also good things about being more digital. Even though I think everybody personally should, personally should come to Norway and weekend to see how great our country and our county is. Uh, but it's amazing during uh, COVID that we have been able to so quickly adapt and change the way we speak to each other, the way we participate meetings, the way we learn and think together. And uh, it's uh, 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 not that long ago it would be um, unthinkable that we would have these meetings uh, and at the same time be able to cut CO2 emissions because we didn't travel to meet each other. Uh, it would be uh, impossible to think that we could do this with saving more money uh, and it would be impossible to do this without using all the time we have to spend on the roads and on the planes to meet each other. So uh, let's also focus on the good things that comes through being more digital. Uh, one of the, of course, very small part of the picture in today's world and worrying about organizing an event in a luxury that is further from most people's minds. Uh, it's easier than ever, but it's also more important than ever. And outside all of our home offices, where we sit around uh, uh, all over the world right now, um, the pandemic is hitting hard and it's hitting unfairly. Unfairly between countries and between people, letting those who are already vulnerable suffer the most from illness, from the fear and the loneliness, and from loss of income. The pandemic has underlined the fact that we ourselves and our societies are more fragile than we would like to believe. But it has also highlighted our amazing ability to change and adapt when we have to. It has really showed us how much we need each other on both a personal and a global level. Handling crisis takes up a lot of focus and capacity, and it cannot be easy to lose. And it can be easy to lose track of the bigger picture and our long-term goals, including the SDGs. However, sustainability is more important than ever during this pandemic, and it is highlighting some very, re, re, very real challenges. If people do not access, have access to clean water or sanitation to wash their hands, it is not just a problem for those who experience it, it is now a problem for us all. In Viken, we have uh, indicated it has added importance to our decisions to provide all students in upper secondary education with computers. This being fundamental for ensuring inclusive quality education for all. Parts of the con consequence from the pandemic is also giving hope. The pictures of wildlife, clean air and clean water uh, returning where, where we humans have reduced our activities inspires me as well. The new ways in which we have learned to cooperate, to be productive, to be creative and how to show kindness to each other reminds us that on, reminds us on what's really important. I believe that many have discovered the love for their neighborhoods, parks and local destinations, the love for walking, for running, for biking, and even in Norway, also the love for skiing. This shows us how we can change and how we can be a more sustainable society, how we, and what a more sustainable society is not only necessary, but not only positive. Oh, Sorry. This shows us that we can change and that a more sustainable society is not only necessary, not only possible, but also something to look forward to. 
In Oslo, the capital of Norway, we know that if all those who travel less than one kilometer decided to walk on foot, instead of using the bus, tram or metro, we would always have seats available on public transportation. And I hope that the increased walking during the pandemic has shown people how short one kilometer really is, especially when you walk through a city. That, that helps us in the transition and, and will make it possible for those who really need to go by these services to have room to do it. It's good for public health, it's good for the commuters, and it's good, good for our communities. In weekend 2021 will be the first year of having a climate account in addition to our financial account. For 2022, we will be able to make our very first climate budget as well. We are aiming, aiming to reduce 80% of our CO2 emissions by 2030. This will demand a lot from us, but I believe it will be worth it. There will be great advantages, not only for the global climate, but for the local communities and for our lives. The pandemic and its consequences are also a chance to shape the society that we want for the future. What type of normal do we want to go back to? In Norway and in Wiken, we are so fortunate that we have both national and regional funds to re reduce some of the consequences for businesses and labor market. We have chosen to use this opportunity to contribute to shaping our future labor market by funding training and education for employees and by demanding that companies applying for funds can explain how their projects contribute to the SDGs. Some expressed that it was necessary, unnecessary, and that we should focus on saving our businesses instead. But our businesses rose to the challenge and we got some really great projects going on. In today's highly uncertain policy environment, the SDGs are more relevant, relevant than ever. In shaping long-term recovery measures in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, in the SDGs offer a valuable framework to build a more sustainable and resilient society. This is shared responsibility across levels of government, across the private and the public and the voluntary sector. And it is, shared, it is a shared responsibility between different professions and disciplines. I would like to open this second day of the round table by thanking you all for coming together in this time of crisis. The fact that you are here working to achieve the SDGs and the fact that you are not letting pandemic make you lose sight of our common goals is both impressive and very much inspiring. I am glad everyone participating here are willing and able to both listen and to share their knowledge and experience. In this roundtable, we are challenging ourselves by discussing topics we still do not have a common solution for. Let, us, let our discussion today be a step towards cre creating a sustainable and resilient future Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tonya, for this enlightening uh, uh, opening remarks. Let me now give the floor to Gun Marit Helgesen, the first vice president of the Norwegian Association of uh, Local and Regional Authorities. Gun, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, dear Lamia, dear Tonya and Stefano, dear all participants. It's a great pleasure for me to address this uh, round table. Uh, COVID-19 has uh, really changed our way of working, uh, so the use of technology now allows us to meet virtually when physical presence is not uh, possible. The 12th of March this year, Norway went into lockdown to contain the spread of COVID-19. This created an unprecedented situation which tested our national system for intra-governmental dialogue collaboration and seamless service delivery across tiers of government. Local democracy was included in our quest for better temporary solutions when individual freedoms had to be restricted and council meetings were conducted virtually. I think in Norway, we stood the test then and we have managed to find uh, new and efficient ways of responding together. The virus still represents a threat. Only when we get full control through vaccination can the challenging tasks of building back commence. We must then not be complacent, but strive to build back better. The SGS will guide us towards accelerated transformation to a more sustainable world. Although probably a coincidence in terms of building back post-COVID-19, 
nor we will finally, when 10 years remain, draft an implementation strategy for Agenda 2030. The process is open and Quest will contribute. Our input will be based on experience and achievements our members already have gained from their ongoing work to make the SGS locally relevant and acted upon. Learnings from how we have handled the unprecedented global challenge of COVID-19, I think will inspire and motivate this work. So what are the lessons learned? First, the need for trust. Democratic municipal and regional councils are close to the citizens, local business and civil society. And trust is perhaps our most important capital in all levels of government, not least at the local and regional level. Trust must be gained and nourished. Trust allows for restrictions on individual freedoms in exceptional cases, such as during the current COVID-19 pandemic in order to protect life. Measures must, however, be time-bound respect human rights, and be rooted in democratic decisions reached in a transparent and responsible process where information is available to citizens. Local democracy must not be suspended, but rather used to find the best temporary solutions. Second, the importance of multi-level governance. In the Congress of Local and Regional Authorities of Council of Europe, where I have the honor to serve as president of the regional chamber, we try to strengthen capacities of regional and local authorities to work towards a sustainable future. In the broad sense of the democratic, social and economic sustainability, we need to factor in three principles. Achieving the SDGs is uh, the shared responsibility of all levels of government. Local and regional authorities need proper competences and financial autonomy. And citizens must always remain at the heart of the actions. Municipalities, cities and regions are key partners of national governments for the restoration of the economy, social life and normal democratic functioning at the local and regional level after pandemic COVID-19. And, uh, and they must as partners in multi-level governance be involved in setting up mechanisms and procedures to tackle future emergency situations. Third, the advantage of consultation. In Norway, we benefited from our pre-existing consultation system between tiers of government. COES act as main coordinator between the local and regional government and national authorities. Post-COVID-19 recovery will require such knowledge-based consultations. USLG's 2020 recommendations to the 2020 high-level policy forum empower, support, strengthen and acknowledge local governments for the SGS are even more relevant when building back better past COVID-19. COES will in 2021 continue collaborating with our international network and national stakeholders with the ambition to present a voluntary subnational review along with Norway's 2021 voluntary national report. It is my conviction that your work over these two days will contribute to the transformative actions needed for a sustainable future. Delegates at COE's highest political body, the National Congress in February this year, committed to localizing the SGs. COE's medium-term strategy from 2020 to 2023 is built around local action for a social, economic, and environmentally sustainable future, leaving no one behind. Together with Norwegian County Councils and Municipalities, COES is engaged in a series of networks, platforms, and approaches, as presented by Anne Rumsos in yesterday's session, which are seeking to quickly localize the SDGs in Norway. Our host, Viking County Council, was amongst the first regional governments in Norway to recognize the need for a shift to a sustainable future when three former county councils amalgamated to build Viking. They early saw the benefit of joint efforts with other local and regional governments around the world in a partnership with OECD on exploring a territorial approach to sustainability. I really appreciate being able to share our practice and learn from our experience. Finally, I would like to, uh, to quote Obama. He said, uh, I believe in change because I believe in us, the people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gun, with this uh, final quote from Obama. This concludes the opening session of, uh, of today. 
I will now give the floor to uh, Aziza. Uh, we are going to start the, the first session of this second day of the roundtable on cities and regional responses to COVID-19. And uh, Aziza will have a keynote speech on the 10 lessons from COVID-19 for cities and urban policy. Aziza, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefano, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you, and thank you very much for joining us for this uh, second part of the roundtable that we started yesterday. We have a few slides, actually two. Good. Excellent. So I'll be sharing with you some of the findings that have come out of um, some, let's say, mapping and uh, stock taking uh, we have been doing at the OECD Secretariat, looking at what uh, around 100 cities from different OECD countries have been doing over the past eight months in response to the crisis. And what you can see on the screen is the, the link to the, the synthesis report, which the, the, the team is also putting on the chat, uh, that is a lot more sophisticated and elaborated than what I'll have the opportunity to introduce in, uh, in 10 minutes, but that really uh, builds on some of the insights that have come out of uh, the members of the OECD's Champion Mayors Initiative. That's a coalition of about 60 mayors that have put the fight against inequality at the core of their agenda, but also the insights of uh, uh, members of what we call at the OECD the Working Party on Urban Policy that gathers uh, in a forum uh, every six months the, the national ministries that deal uh, with urban uh, policy and that have played a significant role in, in shaping new urban paradigms in light of, of the crisis. If we go to the next slide, and that's the only one I will actually share with you, uh, you can see what we have crystallized as uh, the 10 lessons uh, from this health crisis um, that we believe uh, has not revealed anything new or at least not many new things in terms of what is going wrong in our cities, uh, but that has more acted as a sort of magnifying glass or a sort of trend accelerators to rethink the city of tomorrow tomorrow and, and to, to implement, let's say, those new urban policy paradigms. So I'll, I'll go very briefly through them, but I can only invite you to uh, uh, read the report if you want to know more, and in particular, uh, hundreds and hundreds of examples of what cities have been doing very concretely. The first lesson that has come out of this crisis is that while the pandemic uh, has asymmetric impact across different places, what we've seen in the first instance is that national policy responses were originally very place blind. And this, I have to say, regardless of whether uh, countries were uh, very decentralized or not so much uh, decentralized, a number of measures that related to social distancing, to lockdown and, and other emergency measures to contain uh, the spread of the, of the pandemic uh, were originally issued from uh, national governments without um, necessarily paying too much attention to the differentiated uh, impacts across these different places. The good piece of news is that we seem to see now, at least in OECD countries, an opposite trend whereby a uh, more granular, more place-based approach uh, is, is fostered in, in at least the second and, and potentially third phases of the, of the pandemic, but most importantly in the very design of the recovery packages that to some extent in more and more countries associate to uh, a greater extent local and regional uh, governments. When you look at what mayors and governors at subnational level have been doing uh, in handling the crisis, you see uh, not only the implementation of nationwide measures that I mentioned earlier, but also more bottom-up types of initiatives that relate, for example, to fostering the continuity of local public services, supporting SA and business recovery, uh, targeting vulnerable groups because they're the scale at which this can be done uh, in the most appropriate way, but also reassuring citizens, raising awareness and, and, and driving some well-being measures in particular. 
The second uh, lesson is that the health crisis that has largely turned, of course, into a, a systemic economic and social shock. And you've heard earlier uh, the projections from the interim outlook of the OECD that foresees a, a, a GDP drop of at least uh, 5% and uh, uh, um, a gloomy outlook in the sense that uh, by the end of 2021, we will not have recovered the projections that we were making uh, for 2019 before uh, the pandemic. But this crisis was mostly suffered by cities because, of course, there are the engines of growth, there where most people actually work and live. And what we've seen is that the capacity of those cities to recover is actually varying depending on their uh, productivity metrics, their exposure to global value chain, their industrial compositions, their local labor markets. And all this goes into the narrative of inclusive growth uh, that local governments can uh, drive. And there are dozens of examples of what's done on that front in, in the report. The third point is related to what we've all witnessed, and I think, Tonya, you had a point around that in your uh, intervention, with the lockdowns, we have rediscovered uh, the need to shift from a logics of mobility, taking people to point A from point A to point B to one of accessibility, where well-being, proximity is at the core of citizen uh, concerns. And you've seen concepts gain a lot of traction, such as the 10-minute city in Brussels, the 15-minute city being implemented in, in Paris with a, a dedicated deputy mayor uh, for, for this, or even the 20-minute city in Melbourne that all share this idea that within one kilometer, one mile, two miles, walking or cycling, uh, urban dwellers, residents should have access to all the multidimensionality of their well-being from jobs all the way through transport, health, nature, uh, culture, leisure, and, and education, and so on. And, and that's a very interesting concept. Uh, actually, we, we, we had long advocated under the compact and connected cities uh, paradigm, but that needs needs to be um, connected with the, the rural hinterland, otherwise it can also become a new source of inequality because you cannot have strong cities um, uh, acting as islands in, 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 in an environment where you have lagging regions that are uh, not performing. The fourth point is about inequality, and I think this crisis was really an eye-opener at all forms of inequality, inequality in front of the digitalization, inequality in front of access to health and public services, inequality across people, but also places, and especially in large cities. At the OECD, we have uh, long documented that the, the bigger the city, the larger the inequality you have places such as London or Baltimore, where you can have a 20 year expectancy uh, life difference based on your zip code or your subway station. And, and therefore this crisis has somehow made it more visible. And, and, and we've seen mayors really at the forefront of, of tackling such forms of inequality, not only the increased domestic violence and the gender issues that arose also from teleworking for women, but also the elderly and how how uh, they've been uh, taken care of and the local uh, solidarity networks that were built, but also the youth that we know are going to be the most impacted by this crisis. The fifth point is about density, because we've heard a lot of things about density. We've heard things about the end of big, large metropolitan areas and everybody moving to rural green areas because of the uh, awareness that came out of the lockdown. We've seen even some data, if you take just Paris, um, of 25% of Parisians uh, living through, uh, uh, this was uh, basically analyzed through mobile uh, data and, uh, and national statistical offices data, leaving Paris to settle down in rural areas during the lockdown. And the question is, is this really a structural trend or was this something a bit more emotional uh, related to a very ad hoc uh, situation? And what we believe is that that urban premium that, that comes out of the agglomeration benefits that the special concentration of firms and workers in cities generates is not going to turn into an urban penalty, but there is certainly a card to play for mid-sized cities close to large metropolitan metropolitan areas that are uh, gaining a lot of traction these days. Number six, digitalization, which is probably the new thing compared to previous health crisis. Um, from the 
really the history of the past centuries, health crises have always triggered uh, redefinition of cities and uh, new thinking around urban policy. If you take the cholera in Paris in the 19th uh, century before Haussmann was appointed prefet de la Seine at the time and, and started huge uh, water and sanitation works that aimed to transform the, the capital city into a postal card, the health crisis led to urban redevelopment. But the new thing here is digitalization. This idea that we manage somehow to substitute the physical proximity that also explains why people gather uh, in cities by a sort of digital proximity with not only the e-commerce and e-health or telemedicine or even um, online education uh, testified of, but also the telework and the way small SMEs and large multinationals have pretty well managed when it was possible to reorganize their activities around this digitalization. And, and our conviction is that on that front, there will be no return to normal. And this is raising a lot of questions uh, in terms of how we are rethinking our relationship to time uh, in the era of teleworking. Uh, do we all need to agglomerate in uh, busy trains and, uh, and commute at the same time to get to the office at 9 a.m.? Nothing less sure. Uh, how we are rethinking infrastructure? What are we going to do with all these offices where people will no longer go to work all day or at least every day and so on. And many cities are now rethinking their local economic development strategies also because of the fiscal implications of telework uh, and how companies uh, relocate uh, in the future. There is a seventh point around environment, which uh, I, I see this combination of what we call, you know, the Zoom effect and the Greta effect making uh, the ecological transition somehow in many places, at least OECD countries, socially and politically way more acceptable today than they were uh, a, a decade uh, ago or even a year ago. If you look at the proliferation of, uh, of a cycling path uh, and the bronca against the same cycling path in many large cities just a year ago, uh, that's definitely uh, a signal. And all the conversations around the circular economy and how to minimize the pressure on our resources and, and and, and so on are, are getting a lot of attention these days, including in the recovery packages themselves. You can see, for example, in France that a third of the 100 billion uh, euros for the recovery package relates to that ecological transition. There are a number of implications that relate to trust and governance, and I think uh, uh, Gun mentioned that also in her intervention. We've seen all the barometers about the trust of local and uh, of, of, of residents, urban residents in their local and national governments evolve over the past six uh, months along the lines of what they've been showing for the past decade and especially since the 2008 global financial crisis where uh, we saw trust erode with 60% of citizens having no confidence in the capacity of their national government to ensure their well-being and deliver uh, the basic services and usually much higher if not proportionally uh, reverted uh, numbers for local governments. There is a much higher level of trust in local uh, leadership than in national governments which has been confirmed by the way the pandemic was handled. Number nine, resilience is not a new concept at all, although COVID is new per se. Um, and what we've seen from the cities we've been working with is that what to do is pretty clear in everybody's mind and in the local leadership, how to do it and who does what at which scale and, and, and how national governments do their share in getting cities right and in building back better is uh, really the extra mile that has to be looked at. And I'll finish with the last one, which is about uh, global agendas, because uh, this is the topic of this conversation today the SDGs, but also other global agendas that somehow may seem a bit disconnected from today's emergency, but have never been uh, as important as they are now to provide this uh, long-term stable framework um, to rethink from the ground up some of the planning, investment, budget uh, allocations, and, and strategic design uh, that cities are needed to uh, fit for the future. So I'll uh, stop here. This was just a bit of a teaser and I've been longer than I wanted. Um, um, to get us uh, uh, warmed for the panel and the most interesting part is now uh, coming. We have a, a set of uh, five uh, distinguished uh, panelists 
that will share with us uh, what their cities and institutions uh, have been doing uh, to handle uh, the pandemic and how they see uh, the contribution of the uh, SDGs in uh, doing so. And if we go to the next slide, uh, it will be my pleasure now to introduce our first panelist, uh, Mayor Ricardo Rio from the city of Braga in Portugal. Each panelist will have five minutes to make a statement and then I hope we have a good 20 minutes at the end uh, to collect questions and I invite you all to continue to submit as you've been doing uh, questions via the, the Q&A function. Mayor, thank you very much for being with us. You have the floor. So, Mayor, maybe you're on mute. Nope. No. Nope. I, I was trying to join it. It was blocked. Okay, well, good. Good morning, everyone. And good morning, especially to Aziza. Thank you very much for the invitation. Also, allow me a special greeting to Lamia, whom I didn't see for a couple of uh, months already. And it was a great partner from the OECD Champion Mayors Inclusive for Inclusive Growth uh, Initiative that uh, I really um, appreciate. Uh, greetings to all the participants, to all the, the ones that are following us, and um, it's, it's an honor for, for the city of Braga to participate in this initiative and also to share with you our approach. And I was really um, interested in this last slide in which you resumed the, the conclusions from, from the study, in which we clearly identify ourselves, because most of the items that you presented are things that we feel here in the city of Braga. Even if uh, I think that uh, this pandemic situation, more than bringing uh, really a new situation, has confirmed that some of the strategies, some of the trends that we were already developing before the pandemics were the right path and uh, are really the, the priorities that we have to, to face for the future. The sustainability issue in Braga is something that we consider crucial. Uh, we obviously are very engaged in many domains that are linked with the, the sustainability. And actually, we have even created at the local authority a specific role for the sustainability that led us to uh, develop a strategic development plan for sustainability for the municipality. And rather than having just the diagnosis and the strategic plan for the future, we have been very focused in also doing some sort of assessment on the progress that we have made to achieve the goals. And uh, we have been working with uh, two uni university institutions in Portugal, one which is a very recent project, the ODS local, uh, the SDG local, uh, so, so to say, and the other one, which was from the Catholic University, which has uh, more background, it has started a couple of years ago, which is aimed in uh, developing annually at the index for sustainability development of each of the municipalities with a wide range of indicators and that has a final quantitative result for each of the cities but it has more than that a specific analysis of the achievement of all the goals and the way we are progressing in terms of time which is very useful for us but even if it may seem like a paradox i think that more important than having this assessment, which we have been doing uh, so far, it's to incorporate all the SDGs at the local policy in all the domains so that we are always working to achieve the SDGs, even if we are not telling people that this is done to achieve a certain goal or to achieve a certain improvement in each of the indicators. And uh, I think that the, the most important contribute for that um, strategy for the for that perspective is SDG 17 that is the global partnership the way that we have been managed to collaborate with all the institutions with all the citizens at the local at the national at the international level so that we share responsibilities that we have a common vision for the future and that we are very aligned in what we want to do and I think that this strategic alignment between the municipality as the local authority and all these institutions in the city. And at the same time, the engagement that we try to foster from all the citizens in all the projects that we develop are crucial for attaining the goals and obviously to achieve the SDGs. And even in terms of the international connection, I think that it was very important 
all the spaces and all the, the networks in which we are engaged, the OECD, the Committee of the Regions, the Eurocities, the ECLA, the Global Parliament of Mayors, because in all those, uh, we have shared benchmark, we have shared best practices, we have brought uh, the most innovative approaches for each of the areas from the municipality governance to uh, each of the cities. And that was obviously the best way to have a prompt re response and to have a more effective response to each of the challenges that we had to deal throughout the pandemic for, for each of the territories. And obviously one, one thing that I think is common worldwide is that nobody was prepared for this, uh, that we are uh, assuming responsibilities that weren't uh, under the local authorities shoulders up until now, and that we have to value the subsidiarity approach between the local authorities and the national authorities and other institutions. And uh, all the actions that we develop from the health domain, from the prevention uh, area that obviously we have a strong responsibility because of the proximity and the connectivity that we have to the population. In the uh, support to the social institutions and to social responses to fight for uh, against inequality and obviously to create better conditions for the whole population in this uh, challenging time that we deal. But mostly in terms of the economic development, in which the local authorities usually didn't have such a responsibility, but in which we have tried to, to develop very innovative approaches, not only to sustain the, com the current activity, but also to create seeds for attracting more business and to, to have a more positive approach for the future. I think it was very important in all these areas to link the uh, SDGs to each of these areas. And if you go into this report that you've just presented and you see a couple of the initiatives that we developed here in the city of Braga in each of these domains, you, are, you can easily make a match between the initiative and a certain SDG. When we are, for instance, um, fostering the use of public transportation, we are working for the sustainability in the territory. When we are reinforcing the access to inhabitation and obviously to increase the amount of uh, the budget that we allocate to support families that are challenging uh, the access to, to their houses or to pay their rents. We are obviously trying to, to provide those families a more uh, dignified uh, condition. When we are um, also, for instance, working with the small businesses to increase, uh, to reduce the, the tariffs and the local taxes, or for instance, to improve their access to local, to digital platforms, we are obviously trying to make their business more sustainable and that's aligned also with the, the SDG for economic development. And I think that, as I mentioned in the beginning, when we incorporate these goals into the common action of the municipality, we don't have to be valuing at the same time that we are doing this to achieve a certain goal because it comes as a, an extra result of our work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. And I think your 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 uh, nice way of presenting the SDGs not as an end themselves, but as a means to an end, and your job as fixing the concrete problems that are behind each of the goals, rather than uh, sticking to the goals per se and and looking at them as a compliance agenda, is very uh, spot on. I mean, we we've seen several mayors, including yesterday, in the conversation, saying my job is to address the the housing affordability issue or the traffic congestion issue or the air pollution issue and those are SDGs uh, let's say seven and, and so on and and so the means to the end I think is very much uh, interesting and and I think the the SDG 17 conversation and we'll have maybe the the opportunity later to uh, to dig deeper on that is uh, is really an area where the city to city cooperation could also be uh, enlightening I mean uh, it's currently not capturing in the way it's uh, being uh, tracked and assessed the 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 full Full decentralized development cooperation agenda, and I think uh, uh, this peer learning that you mentioned, but also the the tangible way cities from uh, uh, the west and the global south work with each other uh, under that partnership umbrella is uh, is really interesting. Thank you for these insights. There's a few questions in the Q and A. I'll get back to you in the end after the first round uh, for uh, addressing some of them. And let me now turn to our uh, second speaker. Uh, my pleasure to introduce Valérie Hunik. Uh, the head of the economic department of the city of Rotterdam 
in the Netherlands. We're very happy to have Valérie. We know this crisis has had huge economic impacts and fiscal implications on many cities, including uh, uh, metro areas in particular. And Valérie, we look forward to hearing from you uh, what has happened in Rotterdam and how you've been coping with this. Yes. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. I have some slides. I think they were too much for five minutes, but we'll try to share them with you. Uh, at first, I want to like to introduce myself. I'm head of the economic department of the municipality of Rotterdam. My department is a part of a larger department, uh, economic and sustainable development, because we believe in developing towards a sustainable, circular, digital and inclusive economy goes well together, has to go together with our ambitions of being a sustainable city. I think perhaps uh, someone can share our slides. I don't know, I sent them yesterday. Yes, thank you very much. Coming. And Valerie, maybe I will ask you to turn on your camera if you if you can afford oh, it. Yes, the broadband allows you so we see yes. your nice face yes, alongside you the can slides. See me. You have the floor. Thank you Please very much. Can you show the next slide? Because first of all, I want to tell you something about our economy of our city. Because Rotterdam is well famous of the big ports. We have a strong profile, which is linked to the port economy. This economy is strongly represented in the port and industrial complex, but it also made it vulnerable. Some important sectors in the local and regional economy, like transport and logistics, the chemical industry, are, are at the end of their life cycle. There are lots of opportunities to renew these sectors on basis of transition paths and to adapt them to be relevant for the future. This was one of the important tasks for Rotterdam in the recent years. We wanted to broaden our economy to strong sectors, more being more resilient. And we have focused on uh, transition and innovation towards a digital, sustainable and inclusive economy. That was the point when COVID came. Please, next slide. Our responsive to COVID, our city responsive, and its impact on our society and health was a big program. And we called it Rotterdam Strong Through. The recovery and renewal agenda was part of this program and specific for the economic impacts. Um, I can I show you some uh, figures on uh, the slide with the impact of Corona at our uh, city, but there was more. There was also an accelerated di digitalization, energy transition and circularity are under pressure because there is inequality of the opportunity among vulnerable groups, young people, freelancers, flex, work, flex workers, and all other groups in our city. The resilience of our city, the meeting function, the innovation potential and attractiveness are reduced. Business innovation and investment capacity are coming under pressure. We see some sectors have been hit hard, like retail, cultural, tourism, hospitality, but also the maritime sector. And we see mobility behavior has changed a lot. A decrease in public transport, but an increased use and share of cars, cycling and walking. And there's also a positive effect. The profile of the Rotterdam Life Science and Health Cluster is strengthened. A lot of citizens are buying more local goods and digital skills are increasing. At first, our uh, national government and we also as a local government introduced support measures in order to mitigate and reduce the impacts. But in April, we started to draw up an agenda for recovering and renewal, renewal, not only looking at the short-term impact on our economy, but also the long-term impact on our ambition for transition to this new sustainable economy. The renewal agenda was based on various recommendations from knowledge institutions, banks, and universities like our Erasmus University in Rotterdam. The agenda was drawn up in collaboration with a lot of colleagues in the city of Rotterdam, from education, sustainability, work, income, area development, mobility, but also external experts, fellow governments, and our entrepreneurs and their representatives. In other words, broadly approached and therefore widely deployed. The motto of our city council is, we invest ourselves out of the crisis. It's deliberately not a plan, but an agenda. We are aiming for concrete results, 
but we want to be able to adapt quickly to changing circumstances if necessary. So can we show slide three? What did we do? None of us know exactly how the pandemic will unfold and what economic consequences will await us. So we worked with scenarios. Scenarios were in order to get a good overview of the measures needed for recovery and renewal to the sustainable digital and circular economy. We want to be able to deal with uncertainties surrounding the behavioral effects of Corona. It are not predictions, but it are imaginations of our future. There are ex explorations of various hypothetical circumstances in the future based on these uncertainties that Rotterdam faces or will face in the aftermath of the crisis. We used in our scenarios two core uncertainties, global versus regional, in a global world, global support, supply chains are dominant. Or on the other hand, perhaps we can come to a world where supply chains will be regionalized, become shorter and positioned closer to the end markets. And stakeholder versus shareholder value. The stakeholder value, the economy will still focus on profit maximization, the bottom line. Or will there be shareholder, uh, shareholder values? Um, I think the scenarios are uh, very vague and they are in Dutch. <laughs> but we have a uh, recovery plan in English, so perhaps you can read it. The scenarios compromise four different stories of our future, and they made it possible to look at our economy and to test our measurements for different pictures. Can we have slide four? Based on the scenarios, the short-term effects and the long-term ambitions, we made a broad and robust agenda, uh, jointly drawn up with measures in six pathways, human capital and education, broad sector structures, for port and city, economic transitions, energy transition, circularity, digital and inclusivity, attractiveness of our city, enterprise and innovation ecosystem and service provision. The pathways are interrelated and all the measures are a mix of already existing projects, but they even more focus on the economic impact and on economic renewal and some new measures. And very important in this integrated approach is that we want to monitor. We want to monitor the measures. How are they working? What are the results? The impact of Corona, what will be the impact of the local economy? Do we need to make an adjustment? And we want to monitor the scenarios. Are we still navigating on the most realistic scenario? And that will make our agenda more adaptive. Can we show slide five? And you have one minute left, uh, Valerie. I extend it. Okay, to now I will go. Up, uh, I will speed up. <laughs> At this round table, we're talking about the long term economic recovery and the SDGs. Our recovery and renewal agenda was drawn up on basis of the need to link long term economic ambitions for the sustainable, circular, digital, and inclusive economy in Rotterdam for what is now needed for economic recovery, such as jobs innovation strength and investments by entrepreneurs. The SDGs and the Rotterdam ambitions in the field of sustainability and economy are in line with each other and the agenda will help us to give substance to this. Our agenda contains almost 40 to 50 measures and they all contribute to one, two or more SDGs. In the next slide, I want to show you some examples about it. Perhaps you can show the next slide. In the next slide, we combine renewing uh, the economy with our energy transition uh, goals. Rotterdam want to be uh, uh, CO2 free in 2050. And this is a an, an, an large, uh, uh, large uh, goal central to our energy transition ambition. We want to make homes, 10,000 homes free of natural gas and 15,000 homes sustainable by 20, 2020. All these ambitions also um, lead to uh, measurements for the economy. For example, for the short term, uh, last summer, um, entrepreneurs want to have catering terraces. And uh, we decided that they could use 
the parking spaces in the streets. Cars has, had to uh, park in the parking garages. And we gave the um, entrepreneurs circular decking for the terraces. And okay, I invite much, you to conclude, please, Valerie. Yes, uh, a much more uh, a, a big uh, measurement is the energy transition funds, our local funds, which we want to invest in energy systems. And we have locally 100 million um, to, uh, for, for measures for loans for companies who want to uh, go to the energy transition. Um, I have also another slide, but I want to conclude. Uh, there's a lot to tell about our uh, renewal and um, recovery agenda, but um, we have uh, the agenda. You can send me an email and I will send you the agenda so you can have more information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Valerie. And sorry for rushing you, but everybody oh, needs no. to play by the rules of the game. Otherwise, we it's don't okay. get to the discussion and we have 300 people online eager to yes. ask questions. So thank you so much. And let me now turn to the third speaker uh, while we are uh, uploading the slide for Mr. Masa Nori Naga. Wen, Director of the Environment Bureau of the City of Kitakyushu. This is one of the cities that were uh, pilots in this work. And while uh, Masanori is taking the floor for his five-minute presentation, I invite you all to submit your questions via the Q&A, not the chat, the Q&A function. Um, and please do so in writing, because I see some people are raising their hand. But as I said, we're close to 300 uh, participants, and we will not be able to give you the floor uh, to take the floor per se. So please ask your questions in writing and we'll make sure in the last 20 minutes we get to them. Masa Nori, you have the floor. Thank you very much for being with us. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Crystal clear. Yeah. So good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Masa Nori from the city of Kitakyushu in Japan. So first of all, I'd like to express our sincere gratitude to the OECD and the county government of BKN. No way for hosting this wonderful online event. I also must congratulate the pilot city of OECD SDGs project, uh, VK and Flanders, Southern uh, Denmark for launching their OECD regional report yesterday. Kitakyushu also joined the OECD's uh, SDGs project. We are also working hard right now for publishing our report in the near future. Today, I'd like to take this opportunity to present and share the city level experience and response from Asian city with OEC, uh, SDGs concept. As you can see on the first slide, uh, I will go over these five uh, topics today. If these examples are helpful for you, uh, we would be very glad. So next slide, please. Let me give a brief introduction of our city, Kitakyushu. Uh, we are located on the west side of Japan. Uh, population is about 1 million and is considered as one of the largest manufacturing city in Japan. Next slide, please. In 1960s, Kitakyushu suffered from severe pollu industrial pollution, but we, we overcame it in 1970s through citizens' movement, especially through the effort of the Women's Association, uh, especially through the uh, effort of a women's association, which triggered the local state order to agree on strict pollution control. Subsequently, Kitakyushu made tremendous effort to integrate economic environment. Finally, we are able to transform into a well-known green city in Japan. Next slide, please. With regard to the uh, COVID-19 situation in Kitakyushu, uh, please draw your attention to this table. In general, in general, local government has a strong responsibility for citizens' public health. In this context, I believe that our city is relatively working very well to prevent the spread of the COVID-19. The case of COVID-19 in our area have stabilized in recent days. Currently, there are one or two people who get infected each day. Next slide, please. Um, I don't know the uh, exact reason, but uh, there are two main possible factors why we are doing very well against COVID-19. So let me explain about it. The number one 
uh, institutional mechanism, we have already had SDG's headquarters in the city office since 2018, headed by our mayor with all of the executive members in the city office. In order to tackle the COVID-19, coordination in the city office is a key issue. Using our SDG's headquarters enable us to start to take quick and step first responses against, against COVID-19. Next slide, please. Factor number two is that Kitakyushu developed a lot of supportive measures based on the concept of SDGs. We set up around 80, 80 million US dollars additional budget uh, against COVID-19. For instance, financial support was given to the SMEs. Demand stimulus program was also introduced to the local citizens, wherein vouchers and coupons were provided to generate the rise of demand of a local product and services. Awareness, pro awareness raising program was also essential for citizens' precaution, such as wearing masks, keeping social distance, and washing hands, and so on. We also appeal to private businesses like restaurants and other stores to shorten their opening hours. We are always considering the integration of three dimensions for our COVID-19 program because OECD incessantly suggests integration is a really key issue to us. Next slide, please. For the next step, I also like to highlight our city's recovery program from COVID-19. We call it Green Recovery. As I mentioned, Kitakyushu has been one of the environmental cities in Japan. We are continuously advocating achieving the economic recovery and growth with the environmental technology such as wind power, solar, fuel cell vehicle, zero emission steel by our city support. Next slide, please. Finally, again, I appreciate the OECD effort to have this conference and part of city's achievement to publish the regional report. Kitakyushu in Japan would like to move forward to overcome this pandemic with the SDGs concept. It was a pleasure being here and I hope to have a chance to see you around in your future. Let us work together for sustainability. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Masanori. And as a teaser, let me inform uh, the close to 300 participants that the report on a territorial approach to the SDGs in Kitakyushu will uh, be released in a, in a few weeks. Uh, and also, uh, I think it's a very nice illustration of how you've been building on your uh, environmental sustainability assets uh, and, and strategic uh, uh, priorities to drive the productivity and inclusion agenda. I think the way you've uh, uh, managed in your city, the trade-offs between those economic, social, and environmental pillars at the very local level is very inspiring for other cities. Thank you for this. We have two more speakers to go, and then I promise we will open uh, for uh, discussion. We have already about 20 questions in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Continue to submit your questions to us, and it's now my pleasure to turn to a sister organization and uh, a friend, uh, Edgardo Bilski. Uh, director of Research in United Cities and Local uh, Government uh, that doesn't need to be introduced as an institution that has done also extensive work uh, around localizing the SDGs, but also in this peer learning uh, exchange around COVID-19. Edgardo, thank you very much for being with us. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Asisa. I am delighted to be here and to share with you and to hear on what you are doing. Uh, first of all, maybe introduce next slide please as it was many times mentioned in cities and local governments have been on the forefront of their response to a COVID-19 crisis ensuring the continuity of basic services supporting health system responding to key people's demands and even dramatic situations such as homeless loss of access to essential livelihoods it, will, it should be mentioned that in dense slum areas where physical distancing is meaningless, cities took advantage of community networks to prevent the pandemic dissemination. 
such as in Freetown, based on the previous experience on Ebola management. All local and regional governments network played an important role to multiply the exchange of experience between local and regional governments, such as the City for Global Health, and promote solidarity. UCLG, for example, create a COVID-19 solidarity fund. Next, please. As has been stressed by previous speakers, COVID-19 had differentiated impacts in cities and territories. The need for place-based response has pointed out in all regions. However, in many countries, national policies have recentralized responses, while in others, devolved more responsibilities to local and regional governments, sometimes transitioning back and forward from one to the other. In both cases, local government has had to go for beyond their allocated powers to respond to urgent social needs. In a survey conducted in July by UCLG, Metropolis and the London School of Economic, local government for 35 countries identified as main governance challenges, insufficient resources, administrative and technical means, and access to innovation. However, cities, many cities have adapted reinforcing uh, the use of new technologies, be, building links between science, innovation, and techno technological development to foster communication, transparency, public consultations, and enhancing stakeholder involvement. Local financing is one of the most sensitive issues as underlined by different surveys, OECD survey, but also the Council of European Municipalities and Regions. And on, not only in Europe, all, all, in all the continents, local governments are facing local financing constraints. Beyond the current seesaw effects, that means growth of people demands for assistance on one hand, and the reduction of revenues on the other hand, the involvement of local and regional governments in national recovery packages package will be crucial for the coming year. Uh, next slide, please. As it was strongly highlighted, the COVID-19 crisis has increased poverty and inequality. Decades of public service deregulation and privatization policies affected access and affordability, undermining the social value of essential service, among them health. Remunicipalization of public services, a trend that was emerging during the past years, could become an important alternative. To face inequalities in parallel to improving access to basic services, local governments are focusing on health care and social care, assisting women victims of domestic violence, elderly residents, children and youth out of school systems, as well as activating solidarity networks to ensure vital minimums for unemployed and precarious workers. For example, Brussels mobilized a package of 600 million euros and Bogota is launching a Marshall Plan for social and economic recovery. Our definition of the normal has changed. The rediscovery of proximity offers the possibility of reviewing planning. Frontrunner cities are revising the traditional planning approaches, transitioning to shorter mobility, enhancing pedestrian and public space, mixed social and functional neighborhoods, and polycentric and greener cities as well as the development of shorter supply circuits, for example, for food and services. As you see on the slide, Paris 15 minutes or Barcelona super blocks are examples of new forms of future cities. Integrated planning is also taking into consideration structural economic transformations, particularly in cities with the key economic sectors directly impacted by the pandemic as theories of culture. However, to avoid a return to a business as usual approach, these trends need to be adequately supported and upscaled. Next slide, please. COVID-19 has critical implications for governance and citizen trust in local and national institutions. As indicated in the survey mentioned before, 
A central problem in governance is the relation between the different territorial levels of government, as well as the collaboration between local governments themselves. The impact of COVID-19 revealed many gray areas and blind spots in the distribution of powers and responsibilities. As part of local and regional governments exchange, UCLG defined also a decalogue for post-COVID era to link the recovery process to the global agendas, SDGs, Paris Climate Agreement, the New Urban Agenda. Putting human rights, the fight against poverty and inequalities at the center, as well as multi-level governance and multilateralism approaches. In fact, the recurrent complex emergencies, I am talking about pandemic, climate, social crisis, we need a redefinition on the role of local and regional governments in the governance of such emergencies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Edgardo. And to address some of the questions on the chat, uh, we'll be sharing the slides with everybody uh, online after uh, the conference. And there are a few questions, uh, Edgardo, that relate to the fiscal capacity of cities that maybe I'll invite you to respond to in the uh, Q&A session. Let me now turn to our last uh, but not least speaker. And it's my pleasure to invite uh, Mr. Eduard uh, Lizenko uh, from the Moscow government, uh, head of the the Information Technology Department at the City of Moscow, Russian Federation. Sir, welcome. You have five minutes. Uh, hello, hello. Participants on this uh, conference, I'd like to thank you for being here and the uh, opportunity to tell you how Moscow uh, answered the COVID uh, challenge in spring and now in autumn. You know, digital ecosystem of uh, citizens and businesses that has been formed in Moscow over the past 10 years helped our city with its 12 billion million sorry, inhabitants to respond quickly and efficiently to the coronavirus pandemic, which you face in the spring of 2020. To prevent uh, the spread of COVID-19 and monitor self-isolation regime, a wide range of digital solutions was implemented in Russia, in Moscow. Uh, the success of this implementation is based on combination and interaction of our online services, digital ecosystems, uh, the city video surveillance system and the Moscow electronic school, distant electronic school. And of course, high level of internet and mobile networks penetration and accessibility. Uh, the central part of this ecosystem is uh, Mos.ru, the Moscow mayor's official portal, became the main resource of, for interaction between residents and businesses and uh, visitors with government authorities during the lockdown period. It helped users to receive all the necessary services electronically. There are more than 370 online uh, electronic services which we provide to our users. Uh, uh, the, in, nine, in 2020, average monthly traffic <clears throat> uh, was about 20 million users, unique users. Uh, in April, we have statistics uh, of uh, 36 million visits. It was a central month of our lockdown period. In addition to standard services, most are true, and the citywide contact center had deployed a digital pass system for the city car and public transport travelers. From March of, of, to June 2020, the citywide contact center received more than uh, nine and a half million digital pass applications and with more than three million processed by artificial intelligence and machine learning engine, which we call virtual operator. The system reduced the number of social contacts, flattened the spread of the coronavirus and reduced uh, the burden of Moscow healthcare. To make it happen, several city and federal information systems were integrated in the shortest possible time. Uh, the shortest time means that the, usually it takes about months and years, but the, in this case we use it, uh, we integrated it just in, in one month. 
for those Moscow residents uh, with confirmed COVID-19 diagnosis who declared readiness to get medical assistance at home, the social monitoring mobile application for iOS and Android smartphones was developed. To get access to the application, certain documents should have been signed. First of all, written consent uh, to the protection of personal data and either consent to receive medical care at home uh, or resolution of uh, the chief center doctor. Thanks to the solutions used, Moscow as a center of Russia, the capital of Russia, the logistics center of Russia, uh, uh, life during this pandemic remains open to all regions. We never closed the, the margins of the city. When the <clears throat> fall started, we tried to find a balance between increased citizen safety and preserving business life in the city. Uh, that was the reason to introduce a so-called check-in system with uh, QR codes <clears throat> to get access to entertainment establishments. And moreover, not only entertainment now, but to restaurants, to any usual services, uh, businesses and uh, other organizations, uh, which we have in the city, about a million. Uh, it's very helpful to them not to close, but to stay open and still, uh, still uh, help people to put the, this QR code check-in into their phone and to the central system database. And then if uh, we find any uh, COVID-19 uh, patient, uh, we would provide uh, proper uh, recommendations to other pe people who came and checked in in, in the same time or half before it, uh, half an hour afterwards. For now, we have about two million check-ins already for this month, and uh, it showed a good, good uh, increase in interest from businesses and from people. The pandemic, the pandemic has become a new challenge for the education system as well highlighting the importance of organizing online education for children. Uh, an online Moscow electronic school, which we launched in 2016, became a secure and reliable base to ensure a continuous educational process when switching from offline to remote school attendance. Uh, in this autumn, we have uh, half of our school uh, pupils uh, still having distant learning services from this Moscow electronic school. It's about uh, 600 people every day, uh, which are connected uh, concurrently to the central database with all uh, textbooks, tests, electronic schedules, school registers, uh, video conferencing and other, other opportunities which make them a real distant learning ecosystems as a whole uh, learning process. Uh, over the last months, more than two and a half million online lessons have been conducted in the Moscow school and more than 15 million uh, A, B, C, and Ds uh, uh, were, were given to our pupil by our, by, by our teachers. I will in invite you to conclude, please. Thank you. Yes, yes, uh, just a minute. Uh, in conclusion, digitalization of urban infrastructure is one of the key areas of work for the Moscow government. Moscow has created information systems aimed and uh, to increase the greater accessibility of electronic services, improving the quality of life and safety of citizens. We allowed, uh, uh, they allow they allowed us to promptly take measures that uh, provided the Moscow citizens with the maximum level of protection in the face of the global COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We are ready to share our experience and we develop technology in Moscow, not for the sake of technology itself, but for the sake of our people. Uh, thank you very much again, and I hope it will be helpful. 
Thank you so much. Uh, and sorry for rushing you in the end. I would like to leave a window for uh, some Q&A. Thank you for sharing those uh, thoughts. And we have uh, collected a number of questions uh, on the chat, which I would like now to submit uh, back to the panelists. And we'll start the other way around. So we'll start with you, Edward, and we'll finish with uh, um, the mayor, uh, Mayor Rio. Uh, if you can please get ready and respond in no longer than one two minutes maximum each. You don't need to cover it all, but uh, if you have an example or a point you wish to make, I think uh, this would be very interesting. I'll start with you, Edouard, and I'll uh, give you uh, two of the questions that uh, uh, we have uh, collected. The first one uh, was actually directed to me, but from your intervention, I feel you are uh, uh, best uh, place to respond, which is the impact you have seen of digitalization on online education for children. You've given a few examples of how you've been handling this in, in Moscow. Has this been positive, not positive? Uh, what are some of the challenges? Briefly, you can respond on that. And then there's a second question on uh, whether the heavy demand on digital units um, is requiring new approaches for uh, planning waste uh, handling uh, in, in, in your city. And, and, and I would assume this uh, has to do with uh, IT related waste, but, uh, but maybe you have a broader understanding. If you can cover, please, in one or two minutes, just very briefly, those two points, and then uh, I will go to Edgardo for two more questions. I think, as, uh, as I said, uh, uh, distant learning is, was a great challenge for us, of course. Uh, even if you had uh, Moscow Electronic School, uh, the NECA system uh, from, nine, from 2016, it was not ready in spring to get ready to make this distance learning of Half, more than half million people every day, but uh, we make a, we made a lot of efforts to make it uh, more professional. I would say, like Zoom, maybe better mm -hmm. because it it's really uh, tests uh, diary uh, people people with uh, video conferencing. It's uh, divided by class, it's divided by the individual tracks. The, the head has now in artificial intelligence. It works all together and it works every day, every time, even now it works. And uh, it's very, very uh, good job which we made. Mm -hmm. As far as uh, waste is concerned, I'm not sure that I understand waste <laughs> correctly, but um, probably it's about uh, how to clean mm -hmm. uh, uh, every day. Uh, you know, we have uh, in Moscow one of the ecosystems, digital ecosystems, uh, which we call, is, um, uh, oh, I'm not sure in my English, but it's, uh, it's about how to uh, make uh, cleaning every container with waste uh, every morning in every district near uh, every uh, business unit and it's a big 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 plan it's a big big monitoring system it's a future of internet uh, of things uh, data uh, it's uh, gps glonass uh, monitoring by all these uh, uh, trucks people going doing their job etc uh, and it works um, every day it worked before covid it in COVID, uh, just uh, changing people who went to, to medicine. And then it, it works now. And uh, there are more and more uh, uh, data which we have how to make it better. Not go everywhere, but go to the place where they have already uh, to, to get this and okay. clean, etc., etc. You know. I'm not. I'm. Uh, I'm sorry for my English, but. Uh... That's, that's clear. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Eduardo Lisenko from uh, the city of Moscow, head of uh, information technology uh, department. Let me now turn to you, Edgardo, from United Cities and Local Government. Two quick questions. Uh, one minute, uh, if you can afford uh, responding. The first one is, if cities are actually uh, slammed uh, from a financial and fiscal uh, standpoint, uh, how can they rebound and recover? So what are, uh, what is 
maybe a, a response or two you've seen among your membership to uh, bridge that uh, that ca fiscal capacity gap that uh, that and funding liquidity that the crisis is generating. And then there's a second question around uh, what is the sustainable uh, development best practice that can be transferred as such in the developing world? I know this is a hot potato you deal with, uh, how you can ensure the transferability and the replicability of some of these best practices. If you can elaborate very briefly, uh, Edgardo, in a minute or two, you have the floor. Okay. Regarding the first question, uh, resources mobilization. Uh, I have not the magic answer for that. Uh, many cities are building different uh, responses for that. Uh, in general, uh, recover, uh, the, uh, our main uh, question is how local governments will be part of the recovery package in the coming years that many countries are launching. And uh, as uh, um, it was mentioned by Lamia, uh, include several points of several areas for local governments, but it is still not clear how this will be implemented. Uh, in any case, also the question of access to debt, uh, borrowing, because uh, as you know, in many countries, local governments are very constrained. At, uh, in a, and one of the quick questions is about the use of these uh, uh, resources uh, when they are budgetary imbalance uh, in a, in a, in a conjuncture in a situation where you have to face many social demands, urgent social demands, then uh, this is, uh, I have not uh, uh, concrete, because also from one side, you have many local governments that are taking measures to uh, uh, reduce tax basis uh, uh, or to give a moratorium for tax basis for the coming year, for example, for property tax then the scissor effects will be critical in the coming in months and particularly in the, in, in the next year. Uh, um, there is a question also how to implement new taxation basis, uh, but that is, is a question that go beyond local governments and the share between national and, lo and local uh, uh, budgets, uh, taxation is a critical problem. Regarding the transfer of experiences, that's what, what we are trying to do uh, as uh, one of the areas you mentioned before, decentralized cooperation between the first weeks, months, I would say, of the COVID-19. We developed, uh, and you participate in some of them, a, a living life learning experience where mayors from all the continents exchange different responses to, uh, uh, to try to implement alternative. I will say that the, the question of, uh, first of all, exchanging information is a critical dimension. Uh, the question of transferring of technologies, particularly technology, soft technology that can help local governments to uh, share information, involve citizens. Uh, uh, then the question of also how to uh, respond to informal sector uh, and uh, then the exchange between the experience within social uh, and solidarity economy in developed countries and informal sector in developing countries are alternatives that we are uh, trying to develop uh, to see how we can uh, develop these kinds of uh, dimension in the recovery processes. Thank you very much, Edgardo. Uh, let me now turn to Masanori from Kitakyushu. Masanori, the question for you is if you can elaborate a bit more on the SDG Future City. Uh, this is a very interesting program. We've been paying attention to how Japan, Germany, and a few other countries from the national level are supporting the localization of the uh, SDGs. And I think this is a nice initiative. If you can very briefly elaborate a bit more or share a link also, we'll, we'll say more about this in the Kitakyushu SDG. SDG report that will be released in a few weeks. Um, Masanori, you have a minute. Yeah, thank you very much. As you said, uh, in Japan here, the central government and the local government's cooperation on SDGs is a very important issue and uh, always uh, achieving the good, uh, sharing, the, sharing the good practice to all over Japan. That's gonna be a, a great example of anything including COVID-19 uh, policies. So that's why it's, uh, we always try to have a, a good relationship with not only in Japanese government, but also the other SDGs pilot city in Japan. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Let me now turn to Valerie. Valerie from Rotterdam. I will hand over the two questions to you. The one on how you use biodiversity to accelerate uh, achieving the SDGs in, in, in your city. And the second one may be related to food. There were a number of questions on uh, how cities are rethinking their relationship to food security. And it's true that this pandemic has uh, uh, shed light also on the, on the self-sufficiency <laughs> and autonomy and and uh, in the donut economies that we know in, in the Netherlands gain a lot of traction, if you can elaborate on these two uh, little points, biodiversity <laughs> and food, all in a minute and a half, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much. It's one <laughs> in one minute. Um, we also uh, have a big project on uh, seven uh, green urban projects. It's about getting more green in the city and also more biodiversity. So, and we will work on it, it's our new projects. So that, uh, and we want to use it also to get uh, an economic impact, uh, direct and indirect. That was my last slide. Um, when you have it on food security, it's, re it's really an issue. It was already an issue, thinking about how can uh, we support our city with food and get also uh, innovations because, you know, food, food produce is also outside of the city. So we're already uh, thinking about it. Uh, and it was already a theme, not only um, during COVID, but also before, uh, and also the economic uh, chances of uh, food. In the region of Rotterdam is really a, a big uh, supply chain of food from producing in the greenhouses, uh, uh, transportation, but also uh, local food innovations. Thank you so much, Valerie. And let me now turn last but not least to Mayor uh, Rio. Mayor, uh, there's a very specific question on whether you still have problems with erosion on the coast that I let you uh, handle or, or direct our participants to the relevant background material. And maybe I'll put in your hands the question of how you deal with your citizen engagement uh, in a daily basis and whether you've seen from this COVID-19 pandemic the need for renewing the social contract with the local population, how, how you've been handling this relationship between local uh, political leadership and, and, uh, and, and citizens in, in your city? Well, thank you, Aziza, for both questions. And I uh, tried to reply a couple of the ones that were at the Q&A uh, box uh, directly. If any, anybody else has other questions, they may address to, to the email and to the social media that uh, I have uh, um, in my site. Uh, as for the coastal erosion, uh, erosion we don't have a sea in Braga, so we, we don't have that problem yet. Uh, we hope that we will never have for the coming generations. As for the social contract and the, the people engagement, as I mentioned in one of my replies, I think that the first um, dimension that is crucial to achieve that is the share of information and the proximity that we have with the citizens. Uh, you mentioned in your slide the matter of trust. You have to build the trust between the local authorities and the citizens. And that means that when you listen to people, they have to, to feel that there's a consequence on that audition and that their contributes are valued and taken into account in the decisions that the local authorities make. On top of that, we also have some formal consultation, consultation project processes to engage people in many domains of the local activity. And finally, we try to foster the share of responsibilities, that is to engage people and institutions in the implementation of the project so that they are also responsible for the achievement of the goals that we pursue. Thank you very much, Mayor, and let me thank and congratulate all the members of the panel for this first uh, sequence of the of the second uh, day of the roundtable. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for having been concise. I know this is not doing justice to the magnitude of the work you're doing in your uh, respective cities, but I hope this gave uh, uh, the almost 300 participants online now an idea of what is going on and what are some of the hot potatoes that the SDGs can help you uh, deal with. We were dragging a 10 minute delay from the plenary, which we've pretty much managed to catch up. Um, I will now hand over to Stefano to uh, introduce our guest speaker, uh, whom I see connected, Jeffrey Sachs. Welcome and thank you very much for your time. Stefano, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Aziza. It's really my great uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs as a keynote speaker. 
for this session on the SDGs for long-term recovery strategy in cities and regions. Everybody knows Professor uh, Sachs. Uh, Professor Sachs is uh, currently the president of the UN Sustainable Development Solution Network, and he is the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at the Columbia University. He's one of the main world architects on the SDGs and on sustainability work in general. Professor Sachs is also currently the chair of the Lancet COVID-19 Commission, and the OECD is contributing to this commission with various uh, experts, including our director, Lamia Kamal Chaoui, that is the director of the Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Region and City. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, Lamia couldn't uh, join the second part of the meeting, but uh, she said Jeffrey Sachs is an old friend of the OECD, having contributed to different OECD initiatives, including on well being and inclusive growth. She had the opportunity to meet you, Professor Sachs, in her former capacity as a senior advisor to the Secretary General when she was in charge of the Inclusive Growth Initiative. She said she will listen carefully to your speech as she, she believes that uh, your, the work, your work on SDGs, on COVID 19, and uh, your interest in the city dimension will certainly bring a, a very fruitful collaboration and an enlightening perspective to this uh, meeting. Professor Sachs, the floor is yours. Thank you. Stefano, thank you very much. And thanks to all the participants. <clears throat> Indeed, uh, I go back with the OECD a long way, 40 years now. So it's uh, always been a, a pleasure and an honor uh, to be working with the OECD. It's a great organization and uh, absolutely essential for us uh, probably the most successful organization in sharing best practices and in understanding what its member states uh, do and how to do better. So I really congratulate the OECD uh, on, on all its accomplishments. Uh, I've been asked to talk briefly about uh, recovery uh, from COVID and uh, the use of the SDGs. Uh, let me start with the, with the COVID uh, because we haven't recovered from it. Uh, in fact, uh, we're in the worst uh, of the uh, pandemic right now. Uh, what's happening this fall is uh, even dramatic compared to uh, the first wave in the spring. And I do think that we should give uh, some reflection on why we're in this miserable situation. Uh, and the point that I would emphasize is uh, we did not learn very much uh, in Europe and the United States uh, about this pandemic in the last uh, six months. I understand that in the United States, we've had a president who is uh, absolutely incapable of learning and un undesirous of learning. I don't really understand the situation in Europe uh, as uh, much uh, uh, as I'd like to. The reason I make this point is that in the Asia Pacific, this epidemic is under control to a very significant extent. So we're not facing a global shock that is overwhelming all regions. We're facing a, a global shock that is uh, largely under control uh, in uh, much of the Asia Pacific, but is uh, raging out of control uh, in Europe and the United States. And that's what gives me cause for reflection. Uh, the failures are not in the places uh, that normally you would expect to fail. Uh, the failures are taking place in uh, highly sophisticated societies uh, that were on the top of everybody's list of preparedness, uh, but have turned out to be uh, unable to respond. So I do want us to reflect on this reality. Now, if you look uh, in recent days in the Asia Pacific, I'm thinking of China, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, uh, to some extent, uh, though it's, the situation's not quite as good, um, Australia, New Zealand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, there are almost no cases, uh, at least uh, judged uh, per million population. China has perhaps 10 cases. Uh, my neighborhood has 10 cases. Uh, China, all of China has 10 cases. Uh, Taiwan goes days or weeks with no cases, basically. Uh, New Zealand, almost no cases. Australia, almost no cases. 
uh, the United States, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of cases a day. So I want our cities to uh, reflect on this and to understand that we're not even close to normal performance. And this epidemic was largely brought under control, not under control, I shouldn't say that, it was brought to low numbers this summer. Uh, in fact, uh, people declared victory because after the first lockdown, the numbers came down and people thought it was over. But they obviously had not understood the most basic point about an epidemic like this, which is that it tends to operate at a geometric rate unless control measures are put in place. And the control measures are either a lockdown, which is too painful, or public health measures like the ones used in the Asia Pacific region, testing, tracing, isolating, quarantining, monitoring. Uh, in other words, uh, providing the intensive public health measures to break the transmission of the disease. I, sorry to belabor this point, I know it's not the main topic of the session, but we've got to stop this epidemic. And it has to be stopped through public health measures, not by locking down our societies. And it's strange for us, ladies and gentlemen, that with 2 billion people living in countries where this epidemic has largely been brought under control, that we're not looking at that experience, understanding it, taking it into account and achieving it in New York or Paris or Brussels uh, or other cities of Europe, Madrid and so forth, because this is a controllable epidemic that is just not being controlled. Where are our public health teams? Where is the contact tracing, testing, isolating, quarantine, the basic mechanics that could bring this under control? Now, we hope there'll be a vaccine next year. That's the uh, quasi-magic solution. Not quite magic because there's a lot of hard scientific work, of course, uh, being brought to bear. But we need to have systems of public health that are serious and consequent. And we should learn from Korea. We should learn from Taiwan. We should learn from New Zealand. We should learn from Australia. OK, I, I'll stop that little bit of the sermon here. Uh, but it's a general point. We need to learn better. And we cannot be in the hands of uh, populistic politicians like Trump or others who are nasty and mindless and taking us in dangerous directions. And that's true of the SDGs more generally. This requires knowledge, systems, seriousness, learning best practices. Now, why are the SDGs important? They're important basically because they're about a decent society. All the SDGs are, are, are economic and environmental rights stated as 17 goals. They're really no different from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that everybody has a right to healthcare, to education, to social protection, updated to include our rights to a safe environment to uh, the end of human-made climate change, the end of destruction of biodiversity, uh, the protection of uh, land area and so forth. So that's why the SDGs are important because they're a guidepost to a better life and a better society. They're a normative set of principles that are so fundamental that the whole world agreed on them. Now we're not achieving them exactly in the same way that we have not achieved stopping the pandemic. Because to achieve any goals like this requires seriousness of planning. It requires taking the objectives rationally and seriously, looking at what is needed in terms of budgeting, what is needed in terms of regulation, what is needed in terms of uh, uh, cooperation between government, business, uh, what is needed in terms of uh, deployment of technologies, especially digital technologies and renewable energy. So in order to stop a pandemic or to achieve the SDGs, one needs plans. 
uh, and one needs uh, detailed, uh, consequent uh, roadmaps of how to move forward. We know uh, that there are a few major categories of challenge that we face to achieve the SDGs. I like to think of it as six basic categories. The first is to ensure that everybody is getting a good education. Uh, every child is in school. The schools are uh, properly equipped. Uh, the curriculum is uh, up to date and so on. That's a whole host of organizational challenges. It's become dreadfully difficult during the pandemic because the kids aren't in school. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, this is one of the highest costs of uh, this pandemic is what it's doing to, uh, to our children right now. The second goal, clearly uh, relevant, is uh, universal access to public health services and to health care. And uh, this too, we know not only from the pandemic, but more generally, uh, is a, a systems management issue uh, that requires a, a constellation of financing, uh, organization, uh, and deployment of technologies. Uh, we've seen, once again, how digital uh, technologies will be essential for health services. The third dimension of the SDGs is moving to uh, sustainable energy uh, practices. Fortunately, Europe uh, is on its way to do this. Uh, the United States, uh, uh, now we have uh, Biden coming in, who's promised to, to uh, start a belated federal effort in the United States. But for the cities, uh, this means, of course, uh, working uh, with uh, state and national levels or provincial and national levels uh, to plan out the transformation of energy systems from uh, fossil fuels to renewables. This is a planning process beyond anything else. We know where we have to go. Also, the cities have to get ready for electric vehicles. Uh, they have to get ready for the infrastructure of becoming all electric cities. Fortunately, many European cities are well on the way to accomplishing this. Uh, and again, we're going to need best practices. The fourth area of transformation is sustainable agriculture and sustainable land use. The farm to fork program in Europe, for example, as exemplary in this. This is a very complicated set of uh, issues uh, that were just touched on, as Isa mentioned it, uh, a moment ago, uh, the need for food security, better diets, less food waste. Many, many issues uh, are part of this transformation. But basically, uh, our food systems are not sustainable, nor are they resilient. And so we have a, a global food crisis because the agriculture system itself is the greatest source of anthropogenic damage to the environment. And it's the most vulnerable of all our economic uh, systems to the environmental change. Uh, so this is why this is such a crucial uh, area. The, the fifth area of transformation is to make our cities themselves more livable. Uh, we're going to have huge technological changes uh, in the cities. We are moving to uh, digital cities, all electric cities, uh, more e-commerce, uh, obviously more uh, teleservices and e-services, more uh, fundamental change of mobility, uh, not only public transport, but uh, no doubt shared vehicles, much less vehicle ownership, uh, autonomous mobility. Uh, so this will reshape our cities, but I would argue in ways that will make them far greener, uh, and uh, if well designed, far more pleasant places to live, which is a fundamental goal of uh, our cities and of the SDGs. And the sixth transformation, which I've mentioned for each of the first five is the digital transformation. It's clear that this is the most important cluster of technologies for the changes ahead. Uh, I think it's a basic proposition that if people are not online now, 
they will not be able to uh, partake of their own citizenship and their own empowerment. And so we still have a global crisis of uh, even non-connectivity for half the world's population, according to the most recent estimates. And when families are not online, children cannot be in school, people cannot uh, attain uh, e-services, uh, they can't participate in e-commerce, which is increasingly vital. Uh, they cannot uh, partake of uh, e-payments and uh, so many other basic functions of life now. So and then fundamental priorities, universal access to broadband as a, as a basic condition for us moving forward in an inclusive society. Of course, there are a host of fundamental challenges around a decent digital age, uh, surveillance, security, privacy, uh, monopoly, uh, are all uh, tremendous risks uh, uh, that go alongside all of the benefits. Uh, right now, uh, uh, five companies in the world, uh, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, Google, Facebook, and Alibaba, have $6 trillion of market cap because they become the center of the world economy. Uh, this is quite dangerous, actually, the concentration of power and wealth that is uh, quickly taking place. So this is uh, the downside of the digital. But all of this is to say that the SDGs are a set of normative principles for a decent, inclusive, sustainable society. They have to be our roadmap because they are the statements of, as literally was said when they were promulgated, the future we want. They are the statement of where we want to go. Uh, but we need to break them down into manageable operational plans for action. And this means uh, moving resources through public uh, sector means, public investments, public services, as well as through the private sector, directed at achieving the goals that we set. I started with COVID because the goal was clear, stop the pandemic, we have failed. So we need to re-examine our governance structures to understand why we're not able to solve problems right now. Uh, what is it in our societies that is stopping the practical problem solving? Uh, why are we so divided that we are unable to even save our own lives in a pandemic? But that's the reality right now. Uh, we have to solve that governance challenge so that we can also move on to solve the SDGs. Just a few quick thoughts to get us started. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Professor Sachs. It's been really enlightening as always. It's so inspirational to hear you. And actually we have many laudatory comments in the Q&A and chat box that uh, uh, you can read uh, quietly. A lot of questions. I'm not sure we get a chance to go through all of them, but I, I will raise three uh, for you to get started. And then if we can afford, we'll have a, a second uh, round. There, there's a first question around the difference in political systems. Uh, democracy versus autocracy and whether it has turned uh, easier uh, for some countries of Asia Pacific to keep the pandemic under control? I, I think uh, what we're seeing is basically a difference of uh, unity versus disunity. That's a little bit different from democracy versus autocracy. There are several democracies that have done extraordinarily well in the Asia Pacific. Remember, Taiwan, uh, Korea, Australia, New Zealand are all democratic countries. They have all acted together. Uh, they have found unified ways to move forward. Uh, I would say the publics have been uh, very uh, um, well behaved, if I could put it that way. Uh, unlike my country, they don't show up with machine guns on state capitals uh, and talk about hijacking governors. Uh, and so forth. Uh, they've actually uh, uh, been in a situation of trust with the national governments, but these are democracies. Uh, then there are one party states, uh, China, Vietnam, 
uh, Cambodia, um, Lao PDR, uh, that also have uh, done extremely well. It's not simply autocracy in Asia or democracy uh, in, in the West. It's much more complicated than that. Uh, it is uh, actually societies that are functioning better in the Asia Pacific right now uh, that are not so divided uh, that uh, have been able to mobilize uh, public responses and have them uh, adhered to by the public. The uh, YouGov surveys uh, that we have show high levels of trust in the Asia Pacific uh, between government and the population, whether in the autocracies or the democracies, uh, there's trust. Uh, and uh, I wouldn't doubt that uh, people might say, oh, I, you can't trust the poll and at country X, Y, or Z. I'm not so sure that that's really the lesson we should just grab. We don't trust our governments uh, in the United States and Europe right now. Uh, of course, I don't trust my government. I think it's the worst government we've ever had in, in American history, uh, this uh, particular administration. Uh, and it's done a disastrous job and our country's can incredibly divided. And I think that that is all a reflection of our reality right now. In the United States, by the way, we can't solve anything on any single issue for years, nothing. We can't solve SDGs, we can't stop a pandemic. We can't agree on an energy policy. This country's at each other's throats, actually. Uh, and so this is the real question. What happened to society? <laughs> what happened to us working together? What happened to a measure of social trust? Well, we're beset by such tensions, by fake news, by social media, uh, by so many things uh, that uh, give these uh, alternative alternate realities right now that we couldn't even figure out to wear face masks in the United States. That became a major cause of murders, uh, protests, unbelievable. Uh, so this is what we need to face. Thank you. Let me try this second one. And I'm clustering here a few questions that go in the same direction and that uh, relate to the conversation around uh, disaster risk uh, management, preparedness, resilience, which is not a, a new concept itself, even if uh, COVID-19 has led to some rethinking there. And there are a few questions on how much you think uh, this is uh, an eye opener to our uh, uh, lack of preparedness. And, and there are some references to the culture of disaster risk management in Asia Pacific, given that you started with that comparison, and whether you think the SDG framework is passing the COVID-19 test. Uh, is it still fit for purpose now after this major pandemic, or do you see more emphasis needed on some issues such as health, for example, uh, or, or others uh, in light of what we have experienced now? Is it still relevant? I think on the, on the risk side, it's quite interesting when one speaks to people in uh, the successful countries in the Asia Pacific, it is exactly the point that they emphasize, we're facing so many risks and shocks, we were ready for this one. Uh, of course, uh, there was a kind of pandemic preparedness uh, already because of SARS, uh, because of uh, NEPA, because of uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, because of H1N1, uh, there was a sense uh, that uh, those uh, risks are there. But then uh, many health officials have also emphasized to me, uh, it, it's also been the uh, other natural hazards that have come uh, that have kept the societies on a kind of alert, uh, whether it's the earthquakes uh, or uh, uh, droughts and floods or massive typhoons uh, that has led over recent years to more preparedness. And perhaps uh, we've been uh, really blasé in Europe and the United States about this, though we've had our share of disasters after all, but we, we don't learn from them and we don't respond to them. Uh, and, and we see it in the United States. We've had more $1 billion or higher disasters uh, coming with more frequency in recent years, but somehow society doesn't mobilize uh, with our forest fires, our hurricanes, our floods, it's awful, but we haven't had a serious response. Whereas in Asia, uh, that sense of risk 
uh, meant that the countries were on high alert from the first word of this pandemic coming out of Wuhan. Uh, they were already taking precautions, screening people at airports, getting test kits uh, and testing systems uh, up and running. It was a very, very quick response. Whereas, of course, Trump is a different dimension of disaster, but from the first moment he was lying, it's nothing, it's gonna go away and so forth. But many countries in Europe did the same thing. And then what's shocking to me about Europe is that after the first lockdown, restrictions were lifted, Europe went on its August vacations and it brought back the pandemic. And so where was the attention uh, to this uh, after that first grace period that the numbers had come way down Maybe grace period is not the right word, but there was a sharp reduction. But then the precaution was lifted as if it's gone. And so we're not ready for this. Now, in terms of the SDGs fit for purpose, let me be clear. We weren't achieving them before COVID. We're definitely set back now. And we're definitely not on a path to achieve them uh, in the future. Uh, this doesn't make them impossible. This just means we're not governing properly. Governing properly means you sit down and say, in 2030, we're supposed to be at this point. Today, we're at this point. How are we going to close that gap? Oh, that's going to require hiring uh, 10,000 new teachers in our city, whatever it is. And then how are we going to pay for that? Hmm, uh, we're going to have to do X, Y, and Z. It means closing gaps, solving problems, taking goals seriously, working backwards from where we're supposed to be in 2030 to where we are today, and then asking what is the process to get us there? Or to put another most basic idea forward, nothing original, uh, we have to be net zero emissions by 2050 everywhere in the world in order to have even a shot at climate safety. It may not even give us climate safety, but this is our only hope. Now, to reach net zero emissions by 2050, we have to stop selling internal combustion engine vehicles by 2030, okay? We, we have to set midpoint timelines. We have to say no more investments in fossil fuel power generation because uh, we would actually have to throw it out before we reach 2050. So the utility sector needs to make plans based on a timeline for success. My point is that the SDGs are more relevant than ever because it's more urgent that we use them as a guideline for how we want to build the future. But we need a different kind of governance. Looking ahead, planning ahead, thinking ahead, and making pathways to success and explaining financially how to do this. And it varies place by place, but one point about the pathways is you have to pay for investment. And so one has to do financial analysis. And if the financing doesn't meet the investment needs, we need to mobilize more resources. We need to stop tax havens. We need to raise uh, taxes on the big tech companies. We need to put in wealth taxation. In other words, once you do the analysis and find out the investments that need to be made, we can't say, ah, we can't afford that. So we leave 100 million kids without school. We have to say, oh, how are we going to afford that? Well, Mr. Bezos has $190 billion of wealth this morning, maybe he can pay more. Or Amazon is worth a trillion dollars uh, roughly, maybe they can pay more tax. We're gonna have to solve those practical financing problems. Thank you very much. And that taxation agenda very much at the core of uh, OECD's priorities these days Absolutely. Well. And uh, OECD is leading this. And now that we have done our job in the United States of getting rid of Trump, now we need to actually agree on the OECD solutions because OECD has put forward a blueprint for taxes that is right. And so we need to move forward.
Thank you, Professor. One last question, and then we really need to get into the, the panel, which is more related to the global governance uh, of sustainable development. And there are a few uh, concerns that were raised about the multiplicity of global frameworks, uh, different human rights for different uh, issues uh, from water and sanitation to housing, uh, different global frameworks, the SDGs, but also the Paris Agreement, but the new urban agenda, the Sendai network, many of these have actually emerged in 2015. Do you see them as uh, fragmented? Do you see them as mutually reinforcing? And how do you think they can trickle down to the local level when sometimes they, they seem and they appear, and we had a few questions around that, as a bit disconnected from the, the real issues that uh, mayors and governors have to fix on the ground? If you can yeah. elaborate briefly on these two, three minutes, Professor Sachs, and then we'll turn to the yeah. panel. Thank you. This is a complicated question. Uh, there is no simple governance, because we're actually talking about the whole world, multiple systems, uh, major divisions of responsibility, 193 governments. Uh, so I don't think there's a simple way to do this. But what I do think is the most important message I would give is we need to cooperate globally on this. And right now, we need to put aside all areas of our bickering and conflict uh, so that the major regions are working together. And I'll just be specific. We have no place for a Cold War with China. We must cooperate between China, Europe, the United States. We have to stop all this invidious attacking one side or the other to work together because we've run out of time for the pettiness. We need to raise the cooperative stakes. And within every region of the world, we need neighbors to cooperate with each other. You can't solve these problems if Pakistan and India don't talk to each other, uh, or if, if uh, uh, China's on one side and Japan and Korea are on the other side. Uh, recently in Asia, uh, 15 countries signed a major agreement this past weekend, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP. Fantastic. I want everyone to look at it. It brings together China, Japan, Korea, 10 ASEAN countries, Australia, and New Zealand. The geopolitics was put aside for the regional good. This has to happen in South Asia, in Latin America, in uh, other regions. And then these different regions need to cooperate with each other and not say we're in some war with China or uh, we have, uh, you know, the, this geopolitical divisions are our biggest threat. Our biggest threat is the lack of cooperation. So these are complicated agendas. They will be in many different fora. We do have a climate treaty, we have a biodiversity treaty, we have Sendai, we have many things. That's okay if we are problem solving in an honest way. Thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey Sachs. And if we were in a room, as we were for the past two roundtables, I'm sure you would get uh, a, a big, huge, warm uh, round of applause from uh, the almost 250 participants online. Thank you so much for the time you've spent with us. Sorry for not doing justice to all the questions that were asked. As you can see, the chat and the Q&A have been very dynamic. Um, maybe one uh, favor from you, if you can uh, share on the chat the link to any back background material uh, that would be worth uh, reading around those six transformation uh, pathways, because many participants have been inquiring about that, or the OECD team can help uh, convey the information. And we'll make sure in the highlights, we uh, emphasize your speech and your wisdom and, and share it with a much broader constituency than online today. So Thank kind. you Thank so you. much. Thank you, Thank you much. Jeffrey. Thank you very much and have a good rest of the day. Uh, let me now uh, turn to the next panel. And before we do that, I would like uh, also to invite you all to stretch your legs. And uh, because it's been a, a good two hours in a row, uh, it's time for us to hear from you. So I would like to invite you all uh, to uh, take a little poll uh, that is now going to appear uh, online. We're going to use to that effect uh, 
uh, Mentimeter that uh, some of you have seen from the session yesterday. You have two ways of participating in, uh, in this little exercise. Uh, the first one is to take your uh, smartphone and to just uh, scan the code that you can uh, see at the bottom. And I'm doing it uh, real time to make sure it works. And then this takes you to the page. The second one is that you go to menti.com. You have the link in the chat uh, that the, the, the team is putting there and type the code that you can see in red. And here is the question that we would like all of you to help us uh, respond to. What keywords, you have three possibilities to respond. What keywords come to your mind when you think of building back better regions and cities? We're now at a crossroad between in, uh, the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic and from what uh, uh, cities have been doing and regions have been doing in response to it, and the, the next phase of the, of the roundtable that is looking at long-term recovery. So let me now uh, share the screen and we can see in real time the words you are typing. So you are invited to type three keywords and we see here how much cooperation, collaboration, is uh, important in your uh, words, resilience, issues related to equity and to uh, green uh, that uh, go back to uh, earlier statements, uh, innovation as well, leaving no one behind. And we could go on with uh, the list, but really cooperation being probably uh, the the best uh, candidate here uh, and very much at the at the heart of what uh, this roundtable is also aiming to uh, foster. So thank you very much. You can continue um, uh, to type your words if you've not had a chance to, but meanwhile, we'll get back to uh, the slides. We have a good 40 minutes left for a last panel. Thank you all. You've been very patient. Uh, we're slightly behind schedule, but not that much. Uh, and it's now my pleasure to invite a number of representatives um, to share basically what they've been doing with this long-term uh, recovery lens, uh, apart from the emergency measures that they've been uh, uh, dealing with, being uh, at the front line uh, as, as uh, mayors, governors, or, or local and regional representatives of this uh, crisis, and, and some thinkers that have also been uh, taking stock of what's uh, going on. And it's my pleasure to get started with uh, Guto Silva. Um, Guto, you're the Chief Secretary of the Civil House in the state of Paraná. Paraná in Brazil. Paraná is one of the uh, pilots of this uh, program on a territorial approach to the SDGs. You have, as the previous speakers and as the next ones, five, six minutes to make your intervention. Guto, you have the floor. Thank you, Ms. Aziza. Uh, I'd like to, to greetings, every, everyone. Um, first of all, I'd like to, to congratulate Mr. Sachs for your incursion speech. And I'm very proud to, to to be able to speak on behalf of the Parma state government in Brazil. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to greet and thank the OECD and Viking County, then team for, for this invitation. Uh, let's not forget that Viking County is one of the beloved partners, pilot partners in the OECD program, uh, territorial approach uh, to the sustainable development, development goals. Well, the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that we are experiencing globally, and keep in mind that our thoughts, we talk about recovery, uh, it's not over yet, to reinforce the, the, the need to put sustainability at the heart of our actions to recover better. And before I mention long-term strategies, I'd like to, to briefly highlight seven short, short terms, uh, strategy actions for, for recovery, growth and economic development, uh, of our state in Brazil. Uh, this, this action will be placed between the years 2020 and 2022. And most of the, the actions that I uh, will point out are perhaps more related to the SDG 16 in the sense of strengthening the government and, and institution to, to the mission of leading this, this, this process. We must uh, change old paradigms and here I couldn't uh, agree more with Mr. Sachs. One of the biggest challenges uh, we face is to abandon the business as, as usual behavior. Uh, and with the seven parts we are working in Paraná, our efficiency in the, in the use of public access, we review uh, all use of the rental contracts of public buildings and the light of sustainability 
uh, efficiency of use of the vehicle fleets. We will drastically reducing the number of, of, of vehicles by joining a rental car program called TaxGov. Uh, also, we are, we are promoting the improvement of human uh, research management, saving financial research, investigating possible problems in the payroll. Uh, regarding the, the digital innovation, uh, the idea is, is to increase the population's uh, access to online service and the using startups to, to make our local administrations uh, to make uh, uh, strong and more agile to the to the terms of the service uh, provided. Uh, and, and number five, the, for this, this strategies here, we are regulate outsource service in order to reduce costs with payroll and the social security security deaths as well. Um, and the six points, we are regulate remote working. Uh, it'd be necessary to rethink how to, to plan telework environments, which is important to reduce overhead costs, to increase productivity, and to optimize uh, the, the use of physical space. And finally, this the seventh point, it's cutting red tape. We will simplify government uh, actions and providing public service with, without losing quality and modernize the functioning of the state with better organization and work with each, each agency. And above all, uh, regarding long-term actions, we are, of course, counting uh, on the OECD recommendations that will be present on the second mission here in Paraná uh, in early December. And we like, of course, uh, invite everyone here in this, in this round table. And we want to, to see the famous OECD slogan put into practice in our states, developing uh, and, and implementing better policies in order to build a work plan to improve people's lives to people's lives is more than than our greatest greatest desire but but it's our obligation and for last mr aziz i'd like to to take this opportunity to tell uh the great job and support of mr stefan and mrs alini doing with with her is with mr kelly with, that coordinate the, the the economic and social development Paraná state council which is chaired by the government and the constant works uh, management in quadruple helix, involving, of course, government, private sector, academy, uh, society, because we strongly believe in the SDG 17 uh, to, to success. And of course, we need this head to has this new social social contract to, to improve our this relation here with Brazil and, and Parna with the OECD. Thank you for, for the opportunity, Mr. Aziz. It was very very good to, to see you again. Thank you so much, Guto, and to all the team in Parana. I have to say it's been a, a fascinating experience to uh, start this policy dialogue. And uh, as a piece of information for participants connected, the report will be launched at the beginning of uh, 2021. We are in the final stage of uh, fine tuning the recommendations. Uh, Parana being one of the nine uh, pilot case studies of this program. Thank you very much, Governor. And let me now turn to another uh, Latin American uh, representatives and uh, uh, introduce Silvina Rivero. Silvina is the Secretary General of the Regional Government mm. of the Province of Cordoba in Argentina. This is another uh, province regional level. We've been uh, doing extensive work at the OECD with. Uh, Silvina will be speaking in Spanish. So for everybody's background, you have just seen appear at the bottom of your uh, bar, uh, Zoom bar, a globe that says interpretation. If you click on uh, and you click on English or Spanish, but most importantly, you should also click on the mute original audio, so you are not uh, bothered uh, with the, the background. Silvina, muchas gracias eh, por estar con nosotros y te doy la palabra. Gracias. Tal. Okay, Muy I'm bueno. not hearing Silvina. Silvina? Hello. Hello. Okay, perfecto. Bienvenida, gracias. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for your invitation. Um, the government of the province of Córdoba has been working in the uh, framework of the 2030 agenda as of 2016. From the origin, we've been uh, accompanied by the OECD 
Uh, on the first stage, we managed to link all the programs and the policies of the government of the province with the GDS SDGs. The this uh, materialized in, an, in a yearly report that's published in a, in a platform that is up, open and it's uh, currently updated. And when we decided uh, to join as members of the pilot program for the territorialization uh, via the OED, OECD, with, together with Cordoba, we decided to focus on the people chapter, that, that is to say, the SDG 1 to 5 and SDG 10, and to develop, based on the possibility of the pilot, an interaction matrix that allows us to see how SDG helped uh, achieve our priority, our main goal that has to do with social justice and therefore with uh, social inclusion. Having chosen the people chapter and um, SDGs one to five and 10 as our priority in terms of uh, uh, government of the province was not a casual thing. It had to do with a crisis that we had been undergoing at the level of the country, both socially and financially. And it had to do, uh, and it meant that the most vulnerable sectors could not uh, we could not guarantee meeting the basic needs for those sectors. What COVID came to do was deepen that crisis. Uh, the high levels of unemployment together with the, the decrease in income had an impact, uh, a direct impact in everything that has to do with SDG 1 and SDG 10 and therefore it's also, it also has an impact on SDG 2. The fact that we have to go from 100% uh, people-to-people uh, -people education to a 100% remote education has obviously affected everything related to SDG 4. And the, the health crisis in, in terms of SDG 3, given the stress, the stress of, an, of our hospitals, the infection in the city, the mortality rates, the crisis has also affected, has had a negative effect in gender and SDG 5, not only because of the vulnerability of women um, or an, her participation in essential activities and exposure to, exposure to infection, but what uh, the confinement meant in gender violence terms. Since December last year, we created at the provincial level a ministry of women that hardly works in everything has to do with the gender policies. And since the, from the ministry of women, they were telling us that from the beginning of the pandemic so that here in Argentina was mid-March up to October this year, they had received over 6,000 reports linked to gender violence over 1600 time anti-panic buttons were activated. The government gives these panic buttons to victims of gender violence. That means that the pandemics came to uh, worsen a situation that is directly linked to the people chapter and that it's a nexus in our uh, government policy. And the consequences of that is that as in the government, the province of Cordoba has to reinforce the different policies that we have been implemented related to reaching the goals that we have prioritized. In that sense, from the Gabinet the Social uh, Chamber of Cordoba, we uh, strengthen the programs of social assistance with a focus on everything that has to do with employment we also developed a unique base of citizens with all the attributes, both social, familiar, economical, where all the assistance that we provide to those sectors get recorded, mostly so we can focus those vulnerabilities and so we can uh, better serve the sectors that need it the most. Our country has a, a Feature. It has a high level of informality. The economy re registered level of informality at a 40%. Uh, 
So they need a particular outlook on those uh, areas that are the most affected by these type of crises. Today, our poverty levels are within the 40% level of the country level. And therefore, we need very active policies from the social perspective to attend basic needs. And that meant that the government of the city of Córdoba from the next budget that we have just presented to the legislature for 2020 again has increased a 56% the uh, expense in social uh, aspects. And it has also accelerated policies that have to do, for example, with reducing the digital gap. In Cordoba, we have a uh, fiber optic network uh, for uh, miles and miles long, and we have made progress in the extension of that fiber optic to guarantee access of quality internet in over 427 uh, uh, counties in Cordoba, and also attending the vulnerable population that also did not have the equipment necessary to uh, be educated online. So therefore, first we bought 20,000 laptops and, and we will be buying 30,000 additional laptops to attend to the vulnerable population that was not able to access such a basic right as education. When it comes to gender policies, we have also deepened our measures. And for the first time in this 2021 budget, we have linked all the programs from the point of being from the point of view of a budget with the SDG number five. Generally speaking, it's all, SD, it's all SDGs, but especially SDG five, to make all economic effort in the government of, of Cordoba that we have been doing to reduce the gender gap, and especially with a particular perspective in which has to do with gender violence. Now, the pandemic has given us, has forced us to uh, do take actions, con con conjecture and actions for the sectors that have been most affected by this new reality. But parallelly speaking, it has forced us to accentuate the long, short term and long term policies so that we don't lose sight of the goal set by the 2030 agenda. And in line with what Professor Sack was saying in his wonderful presentation, we have made progress, for example, in policies to diversify the productive matrix to promote a new a law of bioenergies and biofuels and transformation of biomass with a new law of uh, knowledge economy, uh, taking profit of the comparative advantage of Cordova, considering its 12 university and its technological plant, thinking in a new matrix with a new perspective placed on sustained economic sustainable development that seeks an interactions that allows us to provide the situations that will get us closer to the goals of the agenda. In that sense, the interaction matrix that we developed as of the pilot test that we did thanks to the OECD it's a vital tool because it gives us a conceptual framework to analyze how each policy and program from the government linked to the SDGs in a, enable, enables us to work towards the goals that the agenda is requesting. So this is a very brief idea. That's the line that we have been following. And as one last remark, uh, to focus on the need of uh, the interaction between the different sectors, social sectors that, can, that not only at the provincial level, but also the need to, uh, to interact at multi levels in terms of government in order to face this great challenge that the agenda was already talking about but that became worse given this new reality in the COVID. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. 
of Cordoba uh, for those uh, highlights and for the emphasis on the inclusion and social justice agenda that you see really as the hook uh, through which uh, other areas uh, need to catch up. We are going to, maybe you need to put yourself on mute, Silvina, so we don't, uh, well, you are on mute, so the interpreter may be on mute as we are stopping the interpretation here for the official meeting. Thank you very much. Let me now turn to our uh, next speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Beatrice Tolain, the Deputy Director of the European Committee of Regions. Beatrice, we've done fantastic work with your teams, uh, including a joint survey on uh, the SDGs in, in cities and regions, and more recently, a joint survey on the COVID-19 impact on, on municipal finance. Thank you very much for being here today. If you can provide uh, some insights on uh, how, from the core perspective, you've been looking at these issues of recovery. Beatrice, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Aziza, for just all these kind words and, and also for uh, the opportunity to, to join this panel. Um, first of all, of course, I would like to congratulate the OECD for its commitment, uh, its permanent commitment vis-à-vis -vis the local and regional authorities uh, as key actors to reach uh, the SDG. And also what is very important uh, is support for developing their capacities in that perspective. So it is, uh, from our point of view, the perfect momentum uh, for uh, organizing uh, this roundtable as we need a new impulse uh, in our collective engagement in the context of this pandemic. Uh, I am particularly proud to represent uh, the European continent in this panel as uh, obviously uh, the COVID-19 has exposed a number of vulnerabilities but also uh, highlight uh, huge capacities uh, to react, interact, and provide also uh, a EU and EU comprehensive response uh, to this uh, multidimensional crisis. Uh, we have also demonstrated a great sense of resilience. I think it will be a, a, a very a strong word uh, in, your, in, your, in your survey, uh, as resilience is not only the ability uh, to cope with challenges, but also to undergo transitions. And a more resilience, Europe needs also a better implementation of the SDGs, which are still, and more than ever, high as the EU transformative agenda. And um, following uh, Professor Sachs, uh, guidance, uh, I will um, mention three crucial steps uh, uh, to support this process. Um, first, I think we need uh, to map uh, the structural risk uh, for the EU uh, and uh, its cities and regions over the medium and long terms. We are quite fragile, we have seen, uh, and we need uh, to learn from these uh, vulnerabilities uh, and fragilities. Second, we need to analyze the gaps and capabilities uh, for the trees for the local and regional authorities because they are uh, quite uh, uh, multidimensional and uh, we see all the connection of this crisis at a single moment uh, with the, uh, uh, the corona uh, crisis. And third, we need, we need of course to impose multi-level solutions uh, to shape the systemic transitions from local to global, from global to local, uh, this is uh, uh, clearly the, the, the main lessons learned uh, from, from this crisis. So to achieve this goal, um, at the Committee of the Regions, we are agreeing for four years uh, for uh, localizing the SDGs. Our concerns refer to the implementation gap, which requires a new mindset in the policy making process. And of course, that's why uh, we need a territorial approach for the long-term recovery. It is uh, the clear message delivered by the European local national authorities in our recent uh, stock-taking event uh, last month on the role of SDGs in the crisis recovery. So I will take the opportunity to share five takeaways very, uh, 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 very briefly from the European perspective, which can be useful uh, for the discussion today because I think it's very good to have uh, the feedback uh, also from, from, from the ground uh, in this panel. First, uh, there is a clear, uh, uh, a clear line, SDGs are the right frame, framework for the recovery. And the sustainability agenda is clearly uh, uh, the main issue uh, uh, for the local and regional authorities. And uh, if we see some example, for example, Barcelona rightly point out um, that uh, more than a year after the start of the pandemic, 
uh, we cannot rely uh, on the classical models uh, to plan the recovery. And there is a, 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 a strong call uh, for a, a more collective intelligence, new skills, and uh, to attract new, new, new talents. And this includes, of course, uh, the digital uh, 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 education revolution uh, in order to leave no one behind and culture education is clearly where we have to invest for the soft power. Second takeaway uh, for, for, from Baden Wurttemberg in Germany, we have to rely on try and tested instrument. Uh, and we need uh, to take uh, the opportunity of using um, the powerful uh, uh, a network which already exists at the local and regional level. We need, of course, uh, uh, to attract more coordination uh, with the academic world, public administration, to resolve our strategies. And uh, we, that's why um, some regions and some cities use their local multi-stakeholder platform as SDGs to gather ideas to elaborate future strategy. Another key point is that we have to use the opportunities of the cooperation at uh, the level of the association of, of the cities at national level. So we have to link the global, European, national, and local level. And my last point will be that we need also uh, to um, make uh, SDG uh, higher uh, uh, in the headline agenda of the EU. Um, cities and regions need continuity and constituency, uh, also with the leadership of the European Commission, uh, to mainstream the SDGs in all policy and ensure an efficient implementation at all levels. And I know that tomorrow uh, the European Commission will issue a working document uh, related to the implementation of the SDGs in the commissions. Uh, and we hope that we, could, that we should be a new step uh, and also uh, a new way of uh, 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 using the SDG uh, for the recovery strategy. That's why we need, of course, to work in partnership. And my last point will be to mention that it is very important in the recovery in the medium and long term that the SDG uh, are more visible in the criteria to access the EU recovery fund. And of course, it's a call for national authority to involve more region and city in the drafting of the recovery plans to access this fund is, I think, a very strong message that we share with you. And uh, it will uh, one of the collective outcome of our uh, partnership uh, regarding uh, this uh, important mobilization uh, for delivering uh, the SDGs at territorial level. Thank you so much, Beatrice, and indeed very touchy conversation that of conditionalities or, or, or criteria for, for allocating such funds uh, from, from the, the, the ground up. Uh, and, and I think you've made very interesting points around multi-level governance and the implementation gaps uh, that uh, uh, kind of multilateral cooperation at EU level can help uh, bridge. Thank you for this. We'll now turn to uh, our next speaker, and it's my pleasure to introduce Aisata Kamara, who's the Deputy Commissioner for Operation and Strategic Partnerships within the Mayor's Office uh, for International Affairs in New York. Uh, Aiseta, you have five minutes. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, distinguished guests and colleagues. My name is Aiseta Kamara, and I am the Deputy Commissioner for Sh Strategic Partnerships and Operations at the New York City Mayor's Office for International Affairs. I am thrilled to join you today. And before I start, I want to thank the organizers, especially the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, for bringing all of us together. I also want to thank Professor Sachs for such a wonderful and critical contribution. As we navigate these difficult times, it is surely important to hear from colleagues around the world on strategies towards long-term recovery from COVID-19 as well as ways the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals can play a role in this process. It is important to remember the impact of COVID-19 on people, especially those who were already struggling to meet their basic needs. And as a result on local governments as the first line of service delivery uh, and resource delivery. 
Until very recently, New York City was the epicenter of the pandemic in the United States. Day after day, our city experienced thousands of new infections and hundreds of deaths that impacted the city in ways never seen before. Since the beginning of this crisis, our city government recognized the need for strong actions to ensure the safety of our fellow New Yorkers. Some of these actions included uh, providing free laptops and tablets to students across the five boroughs so that they could take part in, in remote learning. And this was especially important in ensuring our city's commitment to SDG4 quality education. We also launched an aggressive test and trace program in our communities of color that are heavily affected by COVID-19. And finally, we opened more than 400 food hubs where any New Yorker could get free grab and go meals without any questions asked with more and with more and more families going hungry as a result of the pandemic, this action was critical in addressing SDG2, zero hunger, and ensuring that every New Yorker has access to meals regardless of the challenges that they are facing. As a result of the strong measures, as well as our city's vital leadership, our infection rates have remained relatively low, and we're continuously working with New Yorkers to offset a second wave. However, our work does not stop there. As, as we continue to address the challenges of COVID-19 and look to build back better, it is important for cities to continue to share best practices and key strategies towards building a stronger future. At the New York City Mayor's Office for International Affairs, we connect local initiatives to global efforts. And for background, in April 2015, New York City committed to the principles of growth, equity, and sustainability, as well as resiliency through our groundbreaking One NYC strategy, which is a model for sustainable development at a local level. This strategy ch charted the path forward for achieving goals such as lifting New Yorkers out of poverty, expanding access to nutritious and affordable food, and ensuring that those on the front lines of climate change, often the most vulnerable New Yorkers, are protected against its risk. A few months after when NYC was finalized in September 2015, world leaders gathered at the United Nations in New York City and committed to the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Recognizing the synergies between One NYC and the SDGs, our office established Global Vision Urban Action, a platform in December 2015. This platform uses the common framework of the SDGs to both share our successes and to learn from others on ways we can better serve New Yorkers. After hosting various engagements with both local and global partners through the program, our office wanted to take New York City's commitment to Agenda 2030 even further. In July 2018, we became the first city in the world to submit our SDG progress report directly to the United Nations, thus demonstrating our commitment to accountability in, in achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. And this is known as the Voluntary Local Review. The Voluntary Local Review is a report that enables local governments to share their progress towards the implementation of the SDGs directly with the United Nations. Uh, it allows governments to analyze challenges such as climate change, migration, and even the COVID-19 pandemic. Cities and other local governments must utilize their collective power to advocate for and to create change. This belief was one of the driving forces behind our decision to launch the New York City Declaration on the Voluntary Local Review last year during the General Assembly. At the time when we started, we had approximately a dozen signatories. But since then, the Voluntary Local Review has become a true movement. We now have over 210 cities and states from nearly every region in the world that have committed to, to sharing ideas and using the SDGs to accelerate change in their communities. And so 
Even as the COVID-19 pandemic reshapes our reality, subnational governments must continue to use the process of the voluntary local review as, one, as a way of helping them address the gaps and disparities within their local communities. And to ensure that we call on every local government to join us with the voluntary local review and to join other local colleagues in finding solutions to ending the COVID-19 pandemic. We see the voluntary local review as a process that is an opportunity for cities to take part in global conversation. And so if you have not already done so, we urge you to join the movement. And we also ask all of us to make sure that when we are building our recovery, that we do not leave anyone behind. I thank you for your kind attention and we look forward to collaborating to achieve this SDGs. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aisata, and also for uh, putting a, a very concrete lens at some of the emergency responses that you've brought uh, in New York uh, from uh, free laptops all the way through food hubs, but also the long term vision uh, in, in leveraging the potential of the goals uh, for the recovery and ways forward. Thank you for this. Let me now turn to our last but not least speaker. Thank you, Tony Pipa from Brookings uh, Institute for being with us, a senior fellow uh, uh, at the Brookings Institute, you've been working extensively on these issues of uh, localizing SDGs. Uh, tell us what you've learned and, uh, and any wisdom you have going forward. You have five minutes, Tony. Well, thank you, Aziza. Thank you um, to the OECD for, for having me. Welcome all and uh, congratulations on the work that you continue to advance through the territorial approach to the SDGs. Um, and uh, just to, to zoom back a little bit, Aziza, as you said, you know, Look, COVID's really struck at the heart of cities. It's 90% of the deaths or more have been found in cities. And so, uh, and, and much of the frontline response has fallen to local government leaders. And so when we think about recovery um, from COVID, I think it's really important for us to ensure that city leaders are at the table when we're making global policy decisions uh, about what a re transformative recovery looks like. And, you know, city leaders have been dual tracking. Um, as Professor Sachs said, you know, there is still, we're still in the middle of a public health crisis. And so the targets that represent health and the SDGs remain immediately relevant to end the crisis. Um, access to universal health coverage and, and to the uh, services that people need um, to be able to, uh, uh, to be able to feel safe. But, Mayors and local officials um, and subnational uh, leaders, as you've been hearing this morning, have also been dual tracking. While taking the immediate measures to ensure public health and safety, they're thinking about what recovery looks like going forward. And because the um, crisis and the pandemic has really exposed many vulnerabilities, they are quite clear, actually, when we look at uh, the agendas that are being developed through city to city cooperation through the city networks uh, where cities are working together sharing their experiences as also and learning from each other and uh, creating a collective response. We looked at uh, four to five different agendas through UCLG through the C40 mayor's agenda for uh, green and just recovery cities for a resilient recovery coalition urban 20 communicate when you look at these things it's quite clear that there's a set of common principles that are being expressed by cities about what transformational recovery look like and that's around social and economic equity it's around climate action it's around resilience uh, at the local level um, and it's around the protection of public services and investments that can ensure that those issues around social and economic equity that you're actually reaching the most vulnerable um, that have really been exposed uh, and hardest hit by the pandemic, um, uh, that you're, you're actually leaving no one behind, which again leads us to the SDGs. I mean, that is, that is certainly one of the main themes of the SDGs and the intersectionality that the SDGs ask of addressing issues of equity, um, addressing issues of the most vulnerable and human social response uh, at the same time as we think of a green recovery. So there's green and just recovery. 
uh, really lends itself to the SDGs uh, as a framework for what a transformational recovery looks like. And I would say that the SDGs are useful for that um, on three different levels. And it gets a little bit to what Beatrice was, was talking about, the local to global and global local. But one is at the substantive level because uh, as Asiata was just talking about through the work they're doing with their voluntary local review and, and the, the city strategy that they have, the SDGs provide a framework that enforce, you know, encourages you to look at the social, the economic and the environmental dimensions of recovery all at once and to address what your biggest opportunities are at the local level, uh, but also where your gaps might be and where your real vulnerabilities are. Um, the SDGs provide a value proposition operationally. So the voluntary local review that they saw I just talked about is actually a tool to bring different parts of the city and government together um, to, uh, to break down silos internally, also to provide a wider lens on governance uh, with other stakeholders throughout the city and to ensure that their contributions and uh, that their uh, focus uh, in, in line and complementing uh, what the city government is trying to, uh, trying to achieve. And then it is, um, it is a, a value proposition really for global governance. The SDGs after all were committed to uh, by national governments. It's a commitment that they're making. Uh, it, the SDGs provide a common language um, from uh, 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 a common language uh, between local governments, uh, regional governments, and uh, global governance. Um, and uh, as you, um, uh, as cities uh, focus on the SDGs, it's providing them a way in which to show uh, in, uh, in concrete ways uh, what they are contributing uh, to be able to make a transformational recovery. Um, you're seeing cities have this vision for transformative recovery, and you're, you, you are going to see significant challenges uh, that they are uh, going to encounter in terms of political will, in terms of resources, and in terms of governance. But I think the SDGs provide a real framework uh, for them being able to um, make progress on that as, uh, as they go forward out of COVID. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tony. And I'm not sure if we were, uh, we didn't hear next slide. So I was not sure if we uh, had oh, sorry. to move forward. It's, it's fine, we'll, we'll make them available. It's just because some people are asking okay. on the chat. So we'll, uh, we'll share uh, the, the, the four slides that Tony had prepared that backed actually uh, the statements he made. Thank you very much for this. Um, there's been a few questions and actually two which uh, 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 relate to each other. Uh, I think there was a question around uh, the existence of special programs for uh, teachers to make them uh, fit for e-learning. Um, I will let maybe uh, uh, the representative from New York respond in the chat, if you can, Aisata, because uh, uh, you, you did mention uh, some of the digital support for uh, early childhood uh, education. And if you have uh, things related to teachers as well to support them in that transition uh, uh, towards uh, uh, digital in these days of lockdown. And maybe someone from Cordoba can also respond in the chat for the sake of time. I'm, I'm rushing you, sorry, I won't uh, go back to, to to, to presenters to uh, respond. And then there's a big question on uh, youth uh, as well. And maybe Tony, I will ask you on that one uh, because all those uh, uh, big city networks and diplomacy you've been engaged with are not really youth representatives, but at the same time, we know, you know, there is an engagement group out of the G20 that is the Y20 that was also in, in, uh, in Cordoba actually for one of the last meetings. How much have you been exposed to this youth discussion? Uh, and, and where do you see any role for local and regional governments on that front. Maybe Tony, I will hand over the last and uh, the, the only question to you, and then we, we go to the to the conclusion. So to, to your point about youth, um, uh, we're actually seeing, uh, especially through partnerships that uh, cities and local governments are having with universities, a great, I think, uh, exploration of what youth leadership uh, means to this particular agenda. And it is at the local level with cities and through engagement, civil society and universities that youth are really 
being able to work directly with city governments and city governance. Uh, so I think that's actually quite exciting. For example, when you see LA, the work that LA has done on their voluntary local review has been in partnership with teams of students actually from four or five different universities that they've been working with. Um, and, uh, and in the United States, for example, through the United Nations associations on universities, it's been youth that have actually been some of the most excited about taking this agenda forward at the local level. Getting it integrated into the global governance and those larger networks, I think, uh, you know, that's just beginning and that's going to be more of a challenge. But I actually think that you see the inspiration that the SDG provides. And that's one thing we actually haven't talked about. We're talking about COVID, so we're, and we're in the midst of COVID right now and we know how hard it is. Um, but one of the things that I think we find when we're working with cities who are using the SDGs as their framework and approach and language for what a recovery looks like, it's actually quite inspirational. It's a positive agenda that local citizens feel as if they can contribute towards. And you're actually really seeing it uh, take up, especially with younger people who are also, who are concerned not about just the equity issues, but the climate and the uh, environmental issues as well. Good. Thank you very much, Tony. And uh, apologies, we don't have uh, much more time. We had a bit of an enlarged uh, conversation with Jeffrey Sachs that has uh, uh, put us slightly behind schedule, but it was really enlightening and fascinating. Thank you to all the panelist members. Please uh, stay with us for the conclusion. We'll share some of the next steps in uh, uh, 10 more minutes, if you can all uh, bear with us with, for the slight delay. Before that, maybe, and before I hand over to uh, our uh, host, uh, 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 Mrs. Uh, Bente Bjerknes, uh, the Assistant Director General of the uh, Office of the Governing Mayor at the County of uh, Viken, Norway, to start with the concluding remarks. Uh, I would like to invite you all to a last uh, poll. Uh, we are actually uh, brainstorming with uh, the different pilots of the program about uh, some possible topics for the next roundtable. So as we did in the past, you can either uh, uh, scan uh, the flash code you see there, or go to the uh, menti.com website, which you also have in the chat. Uh, we still have almost 200 people online, so this gives us a quorum. You can enter the code, and then when you enter there, the question is, which topics would you like to discuss at the next OECD roundtable? Uh, if you have uh, keywords in mind, you can have up to three options. And I let you fill in that. We'll leave the slide with the flash code one, uh, well, 10 more seconds, and then we'll share our screen so you can see uh, real time what results and keywords are showing. Okay, maybe we can stop the screen here and the team can share some of the inspirations that come. Probably we'll have as many suggestions as we have uh, participants, but uh, interesting. There are a few things that uh, come up. Uh, decentralized cooperation, issues related to more sectoral urban policies, environment, uh, we see issues of circular economy, energy, uh, the just transition, local engagement, public participation, a lot of issues that relate to local governance. We let you continue to enter your keywords. Please do so because we are saving um, everything and we'll uh, make sure we do justice to your inputs. And while we are uh, doing that and letting the, the last uh, participants uh, fill in uh, the questionnaire and uh, um, convey their suggestions, let me now hand over to Bente. Uh, Bente, if you wish to uh, get started with the conclusion. Thank you so much, Asifa. And uh, thank you for two really inspiring days at the, at the roundtable. Thank you for important topics we have discussed and shed light on through speeches and discussions. Uh, this partnership in, uh, in the project has been important for us in Viken in building our new county and for collaboration with partners locally, regional and national, and also international. We acknowledge that we need to be curious of different methods, actions, and ways of transforming the society, the systems and organizations to reach the SDGs. As well as to boost our own work, uh, we need to keep sharing going forward because through that, we all get better. We move faster and we create better solutions. 
I think it's scary to reflect on that we might be further from reaching the SDGs now than before the pandemic. Uh, that means that we need to transform the society going forward and we need to keep working together. We also need to focus on building and keeping a high level of trust in society going forward. And with that, I thank the OECD for this event, for the project so far, and we are looking forward to keep working together in the future. We are sure we are going to do that. So thank you so much for participation in the roundtable and for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vente, uh, and let me add to the thanks uh, uh, some specific to the very uh, great local team. We've had the honor and privilege to work with uh, Goon, Lynn, Charlotte, Linda, and many others uh, for the case study of Viken, but also for this roundtable, which sometimes you think digital makes it easier, but it's not always the case. Uh, sometimes digital makes it also uh, uh, more appealing and therefore more challenging to, to handle in terms of trade-off. So thank you so much uh, to all our counterparts, the Norwegian Association of Local and Regional Government, uh, the Ministry uh, of Local Government and Modernization as well that we had in, in the opening, uh, Tony as well as the, as the chair for all the, the partnership. And let me maybe just in, in three minutes, if you can uh, bear with us, the participants that are still online, uh, uh, shed some light on what's coming up um, in light of what we've been doing together. Uh, of course, in the very, very short term, you will receive from the team uh, the slides uh, that were showcased in this roundtable, the link to the recording, which we invite you to disseminate so that uh, a broader range of, uh, of constituencies can have access to this roundtable. We had yesterday 350 uh, participants connected today, a good 300. You still uh, almost more than half uh, still online now, uh, despite the slight delay. And please do share that, uh, broaden the base, make Make sure we reach out to non-usual suspects and you'll uh, get later in a few weeks more detailed highlights uh, with uh, the substance that was shared at the, at the meeting and that uh, uh, will provide also for some uh, written support. In terms of the program itself, I have to say when you look back, uh, when this all started in a tiny room uh, of, of New York, uh, aside from the high level political forum uh, in, in July 2008, 18, uh, that was uh, a little bit more than two years ago, um, and uh, how much it has developed uh, since then, including since the first formal roundtable back in March 2019, we can only have hopes uh, for the future, not only uh, because we do have now a framework that is in place to uh, support that territorial approach to the SDGs that was released in the report um, in Abu Dhabi uh, on a territorial approach to the SDGs back in February. The team can uh, put as a reminder the link for you. Not only do we have a data set that uh, tracks and measures the distance of uh, 600 cities and 600 regions to many of the goals, not only SDG 11, where we think we have um, core local and regional competencies, but we now have like robust evidence from a number of cities and regions themselves. Um, the three cases that were launched in this roundtable and that are now in the public domain, you can read the reports from Viken, from Southern Denmark, from uh, Flanders, but also the two cases that were launched uh, three weeks ago, the city of Bonn in Germany and the city of Kopavogur in Iceland. And very important, the four cases that are coming uh, to by the end of the year, uh, Kitakyushu in Japan and uh, Cordoba in Argentina, and two at the beginning of 2021, uh, Paraná in Brazil and uh, Moscow in the Russian Federation. There are a number of cities and regions that have expressed their appetite to join the next phase and to uh, become themselves uh, new pilots and take part in this peer learning. Please uh, drop us an email if you are interested. We'll be happy to facilitate all uh, the information. We're also uh, discussing with a number of uh, founding members of this roundtable how to uh, make it a bit more institutional, to have a, a, a sort of light governance uh, system for uh, the roundtable, the steering committee. Those are all issues we're going to discuss tomorrow in a side uh, meeting. We're also pushing the statistical and measurement frontier, expanding the data set geographically, but also going more granular, small cities and 
and not only large metro areas as we've uh, covered uh, so far, and of course, uh, bridging some of the gaps we've seen in, in the uh, data framework uh, at local and regional level so that we can be as comprehensive and holistic as, as possible. We'll definitely uh, pay attention to the topics you have suggested for the next rounds. I won't commit Stefano as to when the next round table will take place, but probably knowing him in less than uh, six months. And let me maybe conclude here thanking my team. Uh, we are so proud, and I speak on behalf of uh, uh, our director, Lamia Kamal Shawi, but also uh, a range of uh, OECD uh, uh, senior managers and, and member countries of, of how far we've gotten with this program. Uh, it was a dream two years ago. It has become a reality, but also uh, raising high expectations. Stefano, as the architect and the mastermind and the leader of the team, Stefano Marta, thank you very much, but also uh, the rest of the team equally important, uh, Aline, Lawrence, uh, Stina, who's still working with us on a number of case studies, uh, Antonio at some point, and all the colleagues that have supported the logistics today, uh, Mia, and uh, and also in the in the local team uh, of Viken. Thank you all so much. Uh, you are uh, not only the mind uh, and the thinkers, but also the oil that makes uh, the machinery work. And uh, I have to say it's been a perfect uh, uh, next edition of the roundtable, probably not as uh, as emotional as it would have been with people in a, in a room. And I hope at some point we get uh, to hybrid forms of meetings with some physical presence as well. But uh, we can uh, say that we hit the mark uh, in terms of the peer learning experience. So thank you very much, uh, Bente. Thank you to all uh, our Norwegian colleagues. Uh, thank you so much for the dedication, the commitment. And with this, I declare the roundtable now being closed. Thank you very much.